G'day children of the forest, AOS Coach here, and we are talking about all things Silverneth, and not just any Silverneth show, not any General's Handbook 2023 Silverneth show, we are talking Dawnbringers 3, Electric Booger Look, no, it's The Long Hunt, I think it's called, <laughs> uh, we're talking We're talking Silverneth, uh, we are going to be talking about the brand new rules but also where Sylvaneth in general lies. So whether you choose to take the evergreen hunt or whether you go just a traditional oak and brow or, you know, a hard water, whatever kind of build that you choose to build, we're going to be revisiting where Sylvaneth stands in GHB 2023. Um, before I introduce my guest, I just want to acknowledge that this book is coming out on this, the minute, the hot minute, that this book is going to be available for pre-order. So if you do buy the book, if you do buy the box, it's a pretty sweet box, by the way. You get the new hero, you get some Kurnothi, and you get some of the bugs, the spite, the spy, not spite swarm hive, the um, buddy. Spite uh, riders. Yeah, to be spite things. Spite spy riders, riders, revenant seekers. <laughs> At least it's not corn. It's like everything is either blood or skull. Skull something, blood something. Uh, but anyway, thanks again for sending me the book and letting me discuss it in advance. If you want to grab a copy, uh, you can grab it from my partners either at Warpfire Minis in the USA or you can grab it from Element Games in the UK. Uh, link is below in the episode description. Now, my guest is uh, the number one ITC player when it comes to Sylvaneth. He's been leading the uh, hunting harmony at events like NashCon and the Nova Open. We won't acknowledge the GW Open because you play with KO, but uh, I assume <laughs> that was just like your, your once a week takeaway. Go get Maccas, go get Maccas, and then come home for a delicious it, roast. It was it was mixed arms KO. I did never touch 30 Thunderers because I, I tried 30 Thunderers once and I lost a few precious brain cells and I was like, no. Mixed arms is the way to go. So much more fun. Shout out to Tom Modsley, whose list I basically stole. <laughs> Look, you played Sylvan F. You had a little flirt with KO. You're back to Sylvan F. You're still playing Sylvan F. Uh, we're here with Fred Schmidt, um, absolutely champion player. And I'm really excited to talk to you about Sylvan F, man. I saw the rules when I got the rules about a week ago. Uh, and I know you've only recently just got your hands with it. It's pretty exciting. Like, it's different. Yeah. And I'm excited to show you the rules. I will show you the rules, folks, and we will discuss it in great detail. But it's different. It's very different to Sylvaneth. Mm -hmm. And I think for some people, it's going to be like, whoa, wait a second. I lost some things that I built my whole strategy around. Mm -hmm. But for others, they're going to go, this is a completely different way to play Sylvaneth. I think I like it. But yeah. Fred, introduce yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? And why did you get into Sylvaneth? Um, yeah, hello. I'm Fred. Uh <laughs> Uh, resident, resident tree player. Um, so, uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, um, and, uh, member, very proud member of Georgia Warband representing them. Uh, and so I got into Sylvan and Sylvan was my first army in Sigmar. Um, I started playing, um, almost a year ago now as a recording, um, around November and went to the GW store and, you know, I had a couple of months of 40k under my belt, not competitively, just playing at the store. And yeah, you know, I was, and I just had learned about endless spells. And the fact that I could cast a spell and put it on the table was just like, that's so cool. And these models are amazing. I get to be a little mouth eating people. That's awesome. And so the guys there, we were talking, and I had been interested in Sylvaneth because when I was uh, in high school back like 15 years ago, um, going to my dad's comic book store, there was a dude at the store who had this absolutely gorgeous uh, tree lord, Ent army. I, I never played Warhammer Fantasy. I don't know where it was just the tree people in Warhammer Fantasy and it looked amazing. And so that had always stuck in my head. And so I was like, all right, yeah, if I ever go into the Sigmar, I would try the tree people. And then they told me about like, yeah, they teleport all around. They do all these different things. It's kind of obnoxious. And I was like, heck yeah, that sounds very fun and silly and tricksy. And so I uh, bought into the Sylvaneth and I was just very fortunate that um, I, uh, the, the concept of a forever army uh, just kind of fell right into my lap of like the army that I loved the most in the whole world. The models are awesome. The rules are sick. Their lore is really cool. Um, and they're very simple to paint. And I'm a hobby potato and I appreciate that. But um, more than anything, I just love how they play. I love the, 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 the tricks that they have and all the weird little like 
intricacies that you can get in list building. They are very much um, a Johnny army, you know, like creative list building, lots of ways to showcase um, these your, your knowledge of your faction and of your unit synergies. And that, that, that really appeals to me. I always feel like Sylvaneth is a game of 4D chess. It's not that traditional horde or, you know, elite unit, walk up the board, fight, uh, you know, break down a flank, mm -hmm. get into the castle. You know, uh, it's not a, it's not an arm wrestle. I, and I think a lot of, maybe it's my destruction-y, like I'm a destruction <laughs> brother. And for me, it's just an arm wrestle in the middle. Let's just punch on and see yep. who from a, a feat of strength can kind of break the other. But with Sylvaneth, it's completely more like, um, I was going to bring up another fight analogy. Like, let's just use a scalpel, right? It's yeah. very specific. Like, you you are fragile. You go in, you strike hard, and mm -hmm. you try to reduce the amount of damage coming in. But you played the movement game so well. And, yeah. you know, anyone who's listened to this channel, I've always talked about movement being such a critical element, probably the most important part of the game. And Sylvaneth... When you win, it's because you play your movement game incredibly well. Mm -hmm. When you lose, it's often because you have made the wrong decision at the wrong time. You've yep. exposed yourself, and then you've been taken advantage of because you can't take the hit. Yeah, you, you cannot take the hit. You, you obviously have a lot of wounds, but it's not like you're 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 someone like Nurgle who loves to be in the mm -hmm. grind and will grind it out in the middle for three rounds. Yeah, That's not your game. Well, interestingly enough, um, we do have really solid recursion, especially for the amount of wounds we have. We have so many ways of bringing five wound models just back. And we do have a variety of three up saves, but it, it, it you do still hit it on the head where we're like, we're trying to crack open a screen, clear some screens in the first couple turns, and then make a big punch in the middle uh, or on like a juicy flank or something because uh, we do hit hard. It's just... And we can sort of take a hit, but that sustained fight in the middle, we'll lose pieces in two combat rounds pretty easily into a lot of armies. So we have to really play that movement game and try and crack the castle. And uh, it, it really is an army that feels like you're playing on a knife's edge, where if you're able to stay on that edge, you feel so oppressive and you have so many options and angles. But the moment you make a wrong decision and all of a sudden you've lost like four Kurnoths or the whole unit of Kurnoths, it's just like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you fall off. And, and when I say you can't take a hit, I'm not saying you're a glass game. You yeah. Right yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like if you think of fire slayers, you think of like uh, uh, OBR, you think of particular Rami Nurgle who just sit in the middle and it's grinded out. You'll be fighting like twenty mm -hmm. plate bearers, and after three battle rounds, they'll still be there. You're like, how on earth do I get rid of these stupid yeah. Nurgle? Yeah. But you. Man, you can tank like you, your Kurnoths can tank, like you know the, mm -hmm. the Tree Lords can take a punch. But do you want to grind out the victory? Yeah, no, that's not no. your style. Exactly, exactly. I think that's a good distinction there of like grinding out the middle. We can for like a turn or two, and then it just falls apart pretty quickly. Generally, we're wanting to kind of play those side points, play the edges, and we can punch in the middle, and then we just dip out because we don't want to uh, grind it out, like you said. I know when I played against Sylvaneth, the, the biggest challenges I faced when I played different armies is when you stretch me out. You know, you mm -hmm. move, you use the board at its fullest, and you can teleport and move around so quickly that my my idiots that have five five movement uh, are, are so slow, yeah. and I'm kind of like shifting across the board. Also, and then you're like, okay, cool, you've moved and wasted a turn here. I'm going to go mm -hmm. here. I'm like, ah, oh, I can't chase you. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, and we'll talk about it later when we get to the list stuff. I think something that's very important that a lot of Sylvaneth lists can do is something I like to go where you flip the board, where your opponent has spent so much time moving up the board to try and hit that spell casting castle or whatever the core of your army is. And you just say, okay, on this turn, um, I'm over here now and I have these points. I'm still going to get my four or five points, but you've just committed two to three rounds trying to hit me over here. But everything that matters is now... You take the turn the car around, get back over here, you know, near boo boo. Oh, it's so funny, uh, and, 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 that, and that's kind of why I really enjoy Sylvaneth it, as a faction. If you're new to Sylvaneth, you're probably going to make a lot of mistakes, and it's not that the list is wrong, it's just that it takes, um, 
a lot of practice and deliberate thinking in order to to win so mm -hmm. if you are new and you're kind of someone who's trying to get those three wins or four wins at a tournament a lot of it is going to come to practice and deliberate movement not necessarily the strength of the list it's a, a, a very often it's about the pilot yeah um very much agree with that i do also think we're very much a rules hammer army not in the sense of like you're trying to rules lawyer but you have to be on top of your rules and in order to just know the options you have available to you in a, any given moment and we have so many rules that interact in so many different ways with all these different armies it is i mean i know i like we're only human we all get uh it, it just gets there's a lot to keep up with with the army um and then it's like I, I care. I've started making like I just made like a little graphic, like a little teleport guide. So like when you have to help out your opponent, you're just like, hey, here is how our teleports work, because you want to make sure that you are fully mastered how that works as much as you can. And there's and once you do, you realize there are all these options and then options you never even thought of before. And then there are going to be more options that like you play another Sylvaneth player and you're chatting up before or after a game and they're like, yeah, I was curious why, you know, you could have done this. And you're like, that was an option. It's just so many things. I, I played against um, someone recently. I was playing, um, oh, I can't remember what army it was, but like he used a Lariel to come in, make everything overgrown, charge at my faction terrain with a dirt through, destroyed my faction terrain, and then used my faction terrain to dip out. And I was like, her overgrown works on faction terrain? That's amazing. And just like, <laughs> And it's just like an example, like there's always a new wrinkle to learn with this army and that infinite depth is very fun. So shameless plug, my Discord has a uh, Sylvaneth dedicated channel. Uh, that's probably a really good call out is, is talking to your counterparts mm -hmm. and exploring ideas and being open. And, you know, I've said many times, high tide lifts all boats. We all learn together what works, what doesn't work. Some people, it's been crazy seeing how people mm -hmm. look at different ideas and then build around it. But anyway, I want to talk GHB 23. I want yeah. to talk about Dawnbringers number three. That's three, not three. Um, <laughs> I want to talk Dawnbringers three, and I will bring up the slides in a second. But before we segue there, how are you feeling about Sylvaneth right now? Before this Dawnbringers book, mm -hmm. is Sylvaneth in a good spot? Because just to caveat this, I looked at I looked up uh, Warcom, and you haven't really got many things right. You haven't got a points change since July, which was mm -hmm. obviously the General's Handbook. There's been no erratas. Um, some of the discussions I've had on the channel in the last month or two, you know, they've got a new battle tactic. They've gotten yeah. um, some new rules. They've gotten um, tweaks in bad rules. You know, um, I was talking to Cruel Boys literally the other day, and you know, Cruel Boys had some some bad rules mm -hmm. turned into good. So there's been some really good quality of life changes, but Sylvaneth, pretty unchanged. You know, you're not leading the meta. You're not top mm -hmm. five factions. Um, you're kind of just doing your thing. Yeah. Um, you can, uh, we do just do our things. I would say the biggest change in our favor have been, I think the last two battle scrolls have given us some point drops. Um, and we'll can be talking about that later, about how our points... We get pointed rather severely at times for our teleporting ability, um, and it, it kind of inhibits some list building every now and again. But now that our points are continuing to that we have dropped for those two um, yeah, for two battle scrolls in a row, had to remember the word battle scroll. Uh, <laughs> um, it really opens us up to put more on the board, and we have a lot of really good war scrolls that kind of keep us buoyed up even through tougher times because. Um, I would say the only, the worst war scroll in our book is like want these exiles. And then like after that is spite revs, but now at 80 points, spite revs are a really solid like trading piece that you can screen and trade out your 80 points because they can trade up really well. Um, so we're buoyed by our war scrolls, but also this new GHB with the battle tactics really helps us a lot. I, I know a lot of people have, have the, the, a lot of books seem to have issues with the new battle tactics compared to the old book, but in our current battle tactic game, we have roughly three from the GHB that we can do uh, relatively easily. We have, you know, magical dominance. We sit in a corner, just cast our spell, and it can affect somewhere else with spell singer, so we can still do things with it. Or we use our artifact vestral gem to just on a two up, it casts 
I, I got my tactic. Oh, it doesn't even need a two up to cast. I just don't take mortal wounds. It just casts. Um, surround and destroy. You talk about our mobility with like tree rep teleports or spite riders, 14 inch moves. Surround and destroy. If, you, if you're on a good turn for it, you can take it, intimidate the invaders. We just move up the board. Um, we have a good book tack to harness the spirit paths where it's just charge and teleport or teleport and charge. So just play the army. And then that fit, ever elusive fifth one kind of can develop over the course of the game. So our battle tactics game is pretty solid and we're also very mobile. And the, the other kind of buff for us in this GHB that plays into our mobility is we have a lot more battle plans with more than just three objectives grinded out in the middle and a lot more viable battle plans that have those objectives spread out like Fountains of Frost, um, uh, Nexus Collapse, Limited Resources, et cetera, et cetera, that really spread the board. And that plays to our advantage because if we set things up right and work really hard to think ahead and come in with a battle tactic route in mind that we can flow chart and flex through, you can get your four or five tactics. You can get two to three points of turn off primary while stretching out your opponent and doing that game plan, like hitting, striking, getting out, all that sort of thing. And so the, that combination of like, we're able to achieve battle tactics, uh, spellcasting savant plays decently well into our game plan as a grand strat. And then um, battle plans that are more spread out really assists us. And the other big buff is unit coherency changes. Um, no longer having to honeycomb our bugs to stay coherent and fight with their two inch range. You can just wrap them however you need to. And the big glow up has been Kern off great swords because used to be that one inch reach, you're not bringing them. You bring, they, they always have done more damage than swords with the math hammer stuff, but you need to get all six in, which was nigh impossible because you can't honeycomb, they can't reach. But with six, the six man coherency, you could just start wrapping stuff. Now all of a sudden things that used to give us trouble, we couldn't deal with hordes very well. And hordes still bog us down. But Kurnoth swords with their extra attack and with the mortal wounds can start chipping away through some of these horde armies that are coming out coming at us in a way that is different, uh, that, that is more efficient than sides and cheaper. Uh, <laughs> because they're 30 points cheaper for three compared to size. So like those are the main buffs. Battle tactics we can do, the battle plan changes the coherency, and just continued point drops. I'm glad you acknowledged the uh, coherency changes because I was going to say that one of the quality of life improvements was that, especially I remember the discussion probably since the dawn of time has always been how do I equip my Kurnoth Hunters with swords yeah. or sides. <laughs> and, and, it, and we got to a point where we I think we kind of all agree, but look, if you're going to reinforce them into a unit of six, you do sides. If you do a mm -hmm. unit of three, you go swords because of the reach. Now we've we've gone back to square one with the what do I equip my 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 people yep. with? But it's a good improvement. It is a really it good is. improvement, especially for you because now you can do a unit of six swords. Now you mm -hmm. can do, um, as you said, unit of six bugs without having to worry about silly movement shenanigans. Yeah, and it's it is really cool. And something in this book is. Um, very often, and shout out to my buddy Mackenzie, who is also a very good Sylvaneth player. Talk about bouncing ideas off of fellow tree players. We're bouncing off each other all the time. And we'll talk. And the, the coolest thing about these this book is you can almost never go wrong. Like, I prefer six sides. I prefer six swords. They're both valid as long as it fits your play style or how you want to play that list. If it slots into the role they fit in their list. Same with Spite Riders or Rev Seekers. Do you want six blocks of this or the other? Or whatever they are true. Now I would say true choices of what fits the list and what fits the play style and what I want to accomplish with this unit, as opposed to, well, sides are just better because I can put a six of them and then delete something and leave. It's well, my list needs something to deal with hordes. I have something that can maybe clear elite units here. So we'll bring the swords or I got these bugs for hordes. Let's bring sides in so they can do something about elites with the rent three. So there's a lot of really cool decisions to be made. And the coolest part is, Nothing is wrong so long as it fits what you're wanting to do, it, which is another reason why I just love this army. Do you – maybe a couple of quick questions and then we'll move into the new rules and then we'll go to the old rules. Um, first off, how are you fighting them? Because you've talked me all the benefits, right? You told me that you're feeling good, mm -hmm. war scrolls are good, the, mm -hmm. um, the battle tactics are great. How are you fighting them on the top tables against your – 
I guess the big, the bad five or the bad six, right? You know, you've got mm-hmm. OBR, uh, Soul Black, Grave Lords, Corns, uh, Sladesh, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Space Lizards, um, Seraphon. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're, probably, they're, they're probably the big terrors right now. You know, yeah. Corn, if I didn't say corn, like yeah. they're, they're probably terrorizing the top, right? How are mm-hmm. you finding Sylvaneth against them? So I would first say that there's a caveat here because it depends on the list you're bringing. Is it going to be a huge part of it? You know, you're bringing all tree lords with oak and brow. Their matchup spread is going to be way different from harvest boon with bugs or heartwood with bugs or swords. Like it, it's, it's going to all kind of operate differently. Um, I would say, and this also plays out in it. That this is a, a learned th- lesson learned from like the team's environment where we as an army, because of our battle tactic situation and our mobility, can pretty, I don't want to say easily, but we have the capability of just scoring four-point turn after four-point turn after four-point turn. And while we do that, we keep chipping away. And then eventually, if the opponent misplays or if there's an angle or an opening that it presents itself, you can make that punch that really lets you leapfrog into the game as they're trying to find their way around battle tactics and you've kind of limited their ability to do things. So that's kind of a general game plan that if you're going into a bad matchup, just keep getting your points and uh, find the angle where maybe you can outpilot or capitalize on a mistake because our ability to capitalize on mistakes with our mobility is super strong. Um, as for and, and that kind of plays out into our matchups into those big bad five that you listed there. Um, because like corn can deal with us because they have pretty high saves and it's just, it's a slugfest. So we have to kind of spread out the map, play for our battle tactics. Um, Seraphon, um, you know, the blizz- teleport blizzard really hurt us because we have no way of dealing with mortal wounds super well. So if that blizzard came off, it's just, I'll just take my toys and, and go home here. Uh, but now without that, we could, we could always keep up with our points and then capitalize off of a key miscast or something. Um, but now they can't just, here's a skink, die. They have to try and find out, like, oh, here's Croak to blow something up. Well, now we're going to blow up Croak because you shouldn't have put him there. So it becomes, like, this really cool mind game. And I would say that kind of how it, it, it plays out across the matchups, though, like I said, a lot of it is very list-dependent. We have, like, three to four different main archetypes that play that spread very differently. Um I think maybe the the value of like your Kurnoth hunters with bow comes in because yeah. what we're, like getting to a Seraphon list, for example, that castle of Croak with the Slan and friends can be hard for a lot of players. But you've got the long range bows, mm-hmm. you have the ability to disarm a lot of people, and it's not it's not guaranteed, it's not automatic. But we know Scar branding corn's going to come in and slap you in the face yeah. with the boom with the boom thruster. You know, there's the corpse cart that's enabling the zombies. There is, yep. you know, um, Catacross or there's the, the Bone Mason in OBR. Mm-hmm. So, you know, w- with the right play, you have the right tools. So, again, it's not easy, but you it doesn't feel like you're not out of the fight. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Like, I would say, like, Soul Blight is a really tough matchup, as is OBR, because um, a lot of their tools beat us. Like, I can't chip away at something that keeps coming back or you know my ren that i pay a billion points for doesn't matter if they just have a one-up save or something um so those are very tough matches but you really hit it on the head just keep yourself in it and find those angles absolutely and what you were talking about before fred when you said score four is your, your battle tactics being two one mm-hmm. two like on your yeah. average battle plan just making sure you score one two if you can score more, even better, but tr- yep. aim for one, two battle tactic and you're scoring four every round. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got, tr- and hopefully you're going to be able to squeeze some five pointers out too over the course of the game. That would be ideal, of course, because, you know, they're probably scoring their five points a turn, but the, tr- the, the traditional Sylvan F uh, game path has been, you know, three, four point turns, four point turns. And then around that turn three, you've chipped away at enough. And now all of a sudden five, 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 and your opponent's like three, four, like you kind of pull ahead there. And um, and we have a pretty solid battle tactic denial game as well. So that plays into our favor too, as we hit those later points of just not allowing them to have certain tactics. Like you're, you're almost never going to get bait and trap against a traditional Sylvaneth army. For example, you're not going to be able to retreat to if I'm bringing everything, taking all my toys and going back to home base. <laughs> 
Very, that's a very true. That's very true. And you got to have two retreat, right? But good call, really good call, actually. And this is kind of where it's a four D chess, where it's not just a traditional arm wrestle. It is mm -hmm. very much, you know, leveraging the board to your advantage. Yep. Do you have any favorite units in this particular general's handbook? Whether it is units that were doing very well last season that mm -hmm. continue to do so. Or some outliers um, who weren't that popular in the past who have now kind of come to come to fruition. And maybe the yeah. first one I'll call out is I'm noticing a real resurgence in Alariel. Now, I don't know if you've got any commentary on this or why, or maybe it's just a little, little meta pick. But in the last couple of months, I've seen more and more lists going into an Alariel build and talking about the benefits of bringing her back in the late game, obviously mm -hmm. the free summon. Mm -hmm. People are really digging Lariel. Yeah, it's, she can sort of tank stuff. Three up save with 16 wounds, and she just heals 2d6 in your hero phase, which is always a great feeling. Um, just this big beetle on a dinner plate you just go do things with. Um, I personally don't have the most experience with Lariel yet. I've gotten to play a few games with her, but... Um, I mean, we see her a lot. Obviously, Math Mallow has had amazing success with his Alariel and Bonoff's list. I had the privilege of seeing that piloted in person at Nova, and it was awesome. But um, she's just really strong. The summon allows that extra flexibility for something else like, oh, this matchup I would want some three swords or a tree lord or here's 20 dryads. Go and sit on a point that you have to commit more pieces to to deal with than you want. Um but she, she's just a really good, solid piece. Go in, take care of something. Her shot can just be a hero sniper. Twos, twos kind of mitigates the minus one to hit because you're running her up 16 inches. Um, takes a lot to deal with, comes back later. Uh, it's just a pretty solid just monster to run around with. And when you think about it with the summon, it's effectively 600 points, I think, because he's around roughly 200, 230 point uh, summon. So 500 points for just this nice big monster here, though with our points, that does mean things get a little limited elsewhere, but just a really solid piece that can fill a lot of roles, um, a, a solid toolbox piece. Yeah, and I'm seeing her being a real pain in the backside um, in the late game too, given that mm -hmm. she comes back uh, on a dice roll and the later yep. the game goes. So by the time that you get into like turn four, a lot of people don't have the tools to handle a Lariel Again. Again, yeah, exactly. Again. Exactly. It's it's she's she's super strong. And then you know, three spells, no all the all the spells are only lore master. Um and a pretty good war scroll spell. <laughs> yeah, she 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 is great. All right, so I've talked about my my hot pick for this season. Um, is there any ones that you either are a massive fan of that you don't leave home without, mm -hmm. or ones that are like, you know what, this used to be okay, now it's just <clears> really good. Yeah, um, I mean, I think the obvious choice are the Sword Goths um, with that big glow up from coherency changes. And then they have, we always had Tree Song, which is a spell that improves Rend around Awaken Wildwood. But um, Hoarfrost also kind of enabling them where you make that roll, it's like, oh, that's a two. They're Rend two now. Or like uh, Rend three swords coming in with mortals on sixes to hit with four attack. Like if you get that five up on the Hoarfrost with the, the three on the D3, on swords, they're actually just sides with an extra attack in mortals. Um, uh, but so I would say those are the obvious pick. Um, two units that have, for me, really stuck out. One has been the Spite Rider Lancers, though I know they've gotten a lot of play in the past. Obviously, with Bounty Hunters, Spite Riders were insane. Um, and they've always been really strong. But I've been personally, like, my big thing with them, and this isn't overarching six man packs of spite riders are awesome but i really like those msu three man just unit of spite riders go and get me surrounded destroy go and take care of that 14 inch move and fly go do a job they have the fight first on the charge and they can rally on fives with their musicians alive six inch pile just this little bundle of just take care of something be a little annoying to deal with and then if you don't fully wipe them i'm just going to pull them back and rally them or use a spell to bring them back um, and then the other one for me has been Branch Witches. Um, so Warsong Revenant being 300 points is really expensive. He's still a great piece. The four up ward basically makes spellcasting savant almost a given, but um, he's only two spells, only knows one spell, two casts, sorry, and a situational plus one to cast. So it gets 
you could get the same amount of casts from a branch from two branch witches and no two spells, and you get a spice from hive or a war song revenant and or versus a branch witch and spite rider lancers, which are now the same amount of points. So it kind of gets to that interesting thing. And the branch witch also knows the same spell as the war song, the infamous war song bomb, where you know, put make a spell stinger, pick a tree, everything within nine inches is gonna take some mortal wounds. But that's on the branch witch war scroll spell for two less casting value. Um, and it's really elevated by the rule that lets you give yourself an extra cast on these wizards. Now, War Song with three casts is super strong. We used to use the Arcane Tome for that. But a Branch Witch now can have those two casts. And effectively, if you're going second, be that War Song Revenant for 190 points less. Though she is very susceptible. Like, there's those mortal wounds coming from Seraphon. Comet's Call, haha. Laser Beam from the, the Realm Shaper. Goodbye, your Grand Strat. But. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed using my two branch witches and just another little body to go do jobs when I need them to. It's just really strong. And then I can also put the second branch witch to go unbind things. And my other one just goes hide in a corner. That's like my general, my grand server spell cast and savant. So this little one can go and do things or screen out for the other branch witch where, you know, the war song, you, you occasionally have to use a lot of teleports to keep them safe. So it's just, and again, this really just comes down to play style. I like the extra flexibility where the war song has a lot more security in there. Yeah, if you're going to take big spellcasting Zavant for your grand strategy, mm -hmm. and uh, I see one of your familiars is, has appeared. Uh, shout out to the cat. Yep, that's I, I have two. I have Jinjo uh, for any banjo kazooie fans out there because she sounds like a Jinjo crying for help, and we have Till Yulenspiegel for <laughs> a German folklore prankster and troll, and it fits him to a T. So. <laughs> I, I love it. Maybe two other units that I've seen become popular. Well, not, I wouldn't say popular, sorry. Let me refrain from that. I, I've seen people revisiting them. The Gossamid Archer. Mm -hmm. Now, people trashed that war scroll when they saw <laughs> the points. When they saw the points, they went, this is horrible. But now you've got all these Antorian locuses, and I'm seeing, um, yeah, Antorian locuses still benefit from Lookout Sir. But going for that just sixes does D3 mortal wounds, ignoring the lookout surge, just fishing for the sixes and mm -hmm. sniping those little heroes. Um, yep. I've seen people playing around with it. I don't know if the jury is out yet on if it's a really good unit or not, but I've at least seen in the first couple of months people going in with this unit. Do you have any opinions or thoughts on the gossip? It's, they are still 210. Yeah. yeah five two models that are yeah. super frail. Yeah, like they'll die to a stiff breeze of shooting immortal wounds, but we do have our awakened wild wizard just kind of hide them. Now it's a screen you can't shoot. You're going to have to move into them. You're going to have to charge around the physical tree model inside those wild woods as well. And then it's like, ah, two up, bye. <laughs> That's, you know, and now you're stuck here. Um, and then the hero sniping is really good as well. And if you get things set up right, you can charge in, you know, move up your 12 shoot the hero, charge with these little dudes over here, and I'm just going to dip them out. So I just shot your hero for free. Mm. Free, effectively. Uh, you had to use some TP economy for that teleport economy, but it, it's, you know, really, really good screen. Um, very tricky to use. I'm not going to say I've mastered them at all, um, though it, it's just, they, they can, like you said, they can go snipe a hero, a really strong screen, set them in that Awakened Wildwood so they can't get shot in the relevant matchups, um, and just unleash hell and get out of dodge and now they're something is stuck there and once again you've pulled something forward whether it's something you want to kill or it pulled a, them away from the thing behind them that you want to kill just kind of enabling that um i personally think they're probably too expensive still but 210 is not the not that bad um and uh i personally have a, a dream list where a world without shooting or mortal wounds where I bring a break a 10 of them and just that's because the two inch coherency, you could just cover over 30 inches in a straight line and just say, all right, melee army. <laughs> they, they do feel a little like if they were like 180 or like mm -hmm. 170 to 190, you know, they're definitely yeah. more appealing, but I, I do like the hero sniping abilities. And if you yeah. took a unit of five, I think it does bring something um, to your list. So I don't mm -hmm. want to write them off completely, but being, Absolutely able, to snipe, not. Yeah. being able to snipe off those Blizzard, Hoarfrost, Antorian Acolytes, or Antorian Battalions or Acolytes, 
Um, not bad. I, I, I wouldn't rubbish them, but I also wouldn't say they're a, a top. Yeah, unit. I, I would also say they're a unit, and this is why I don't feel the most confident speaking on them, despite having like some opinions. They're a unit that takes a lot of practice to use. They're yeah. super fragile. Two tens for ten wounds on a five up. You gotta know your stuff with that unit. Um, in order to really you um, protect them, you got to yeah. protect them. You can't take damage. You need to go in there with the full five and do most damage, and then get them out of harm's way ASAP. They remind me of my, my goblin fanatics, where I've got to get in, make the most <laughs> of those goblin fanatics, because if they fail, it's a complete waste of points, mm -hmm. and I shouldn't have even taken them. But final question, final question. They're bringing up the rules. I swear, I'm not teasing you, folks. I do actually have them. There's a critical change that we have not acknowledged that's not in Sylvaneth, but it is a big impact to Sylvaneth. Do you know where I'm going with this, Fred? I think so. Is it a... Uh, Cities this... of Sigma, Battle Mage, your yep. favorite ally, who's going to get changed yep. in probably the next four to eight weeks. Yep. Four to eight weeks. So for anyone who hasn't seen the new Cities of Sigma, the War Scroll has significantly changed for the Battle Mage. The Battle Mage being currently a great Sylvaneth ally mm -hmm. because you get plus one to the spell cast while we're in Gur. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, there is a Gur Battle Mage that gives you plus two to your your run and charge. Or Just charge. charge. Uh, I think it's run and charge, yeah. Run and charge. Run and charge. Definitely charge. Uh, that's the important one. <laughs> that, that's where I'm going. So you, you see a, a very popular combination on the tournament scene where the Battle Mage is allied, comes in, gives you plus two to your move. Oh. Your spite swarm hive makes it a plus five. Or if it gets if one of them fails, you've still got the other. So you risk mitigate the strike and fade. That's going away. Sometime yep. in the next couple of months, it's disappearing. Yep. What's the impact? How do you think about it? What does that change do to you? Uh, enjoy it while it lasts. Yeah. So, hmm. So that is a really important piece. It's like 100 points still, 100, 110. Here's plus two to the charge. Let's make our little yo-yo unit traditionally use the Kurnoth, set up the Spite Storm Hive out of vision so they can't dispel it, give them plus five to charge, go get them, Durthu, six Kurnoth, whatever, lift it, lift whatever you're running them at, pick them up, reload, ready to go next turn, make the opponent very sad they couldn't touch you in return. Um, however, this kind of leads into a broader thing we already as an army are, we can be super dependent on our spells and a lot of lists are super dependent on our spells. However, that provides a much swingier experience in my opinion, because all of our relevant spells besides regrowth, which is a D6 heal spell, are casting value seven. Virtuous Harmony, bring a model back. Spites from Hive, our plus three to move and charge spell. Endless spell, and that needs a two up to go off, um, as well as Tree Song, which is that rend improvement spell, are all casting value sevens. Even the War Song bomb on the War Song Revenant is a casting value seven. So going, yeah, sevens are more likely than not, but we need to always be prepared for our spells to not go off. I my personal judgment of like what is a good list that I would like to take usually to an event, usually comes down to can this list function and do what I want it to do if none of my spells go off? I need to always be prepared for everything to fail. And a lot of books and a lot of lists kind of flounder if, you know, Spice from Hive 2-Up didn't go off. Well, that's a waste. Um, do, do you have a plan B? Like, oh, my Kurnoth Yoyo isn't going to make a 9 charge today. But I can put them on the point inside of some cover. Maybe that works. But like that's and but that's kind of where it comes down to it. So you generally want to be building your list to be okay without the battle mage already. And then when you do get those spells, because your list is built to work without them, but then the spells went off. Whew, it's a party. I like it because I've seen I've I've played against so many players where um, I have unbound either the uh, mm -hmm. wild form the the battle major spell mm -hmm. the spite swarm hive didn't go off 
or neither of them went off. And now with Primal Magic Dice, I can put more of my points yeah. into removing them. So all of a sudden, you have this guarantee in your head, turn one, I was going to buff up Durthu, and I let those buffs go off. I'm like, yeah, cool, buff, buff yep. it up to your heart's content. And yep. the minute you go for those movement things, boom, dispel, boom, dispel. And it's like, yep. okay, well, my plan was to top of turn one, alpha strike you, Mm -hmm. Now I can't. Mm -hmm. I lose the priority going from turn one to turn two. Now I'm sitting there and most people go, oh, I'll just wait a turn and then I'll try again in turn two and, and, and relaunch that attack. But actually now I've had potentially two turns to move yep. up into you, mm -hmm. damage you, and that's thrown people off significantly. Yep. So I'm not trying to say how good I am. What I'm trying to say is that that oh, was a massive linchpin that if that thing mm -hmm. failed, um, it threw you off and you couldn't yeah. afford those turns to, to be not doing your thing. Yeah. And I mean, this happens to me all the time. I'll be like, yep, you know, spikes from hive did happen this turn. I'll catch myself leaning on my spells goes off. And it's like, here I go. Here are my six current offs. Oh, look at that. I couldn't roll a six on a, with a reroll. Then my current are just sitting there. And so you always, you know, when you <laughs> good tip, when you teleport to make a charge, Always position them as if you're going to fail that charge. So like, you will be so much happier with yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it, 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 yeah. Sorry, I think I talked over you there. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. No, that's fine. I, I think I think I just wanted to acknowledge it because the battle mage is changing mm -hmm. and it is a very common ally right now. Mm -hmm. And you know, when that band game gets ripped off, what do you do? Does it completely change yeah. my strategy? Is there something else that can bring the movement shenanigans? Like, are we just relying on Spice Warm Hive? Yeah. Um, I think I actually like that it's going away because it allows us to use Silva, these, a lot of these units in much different, I think, more interesting ways. Like, the yo yo is always cool, you know, load up some Kernoth, load up a Dirthu, boom. Throw them, yo-yo them back, do it again the next turn. Always fun and satisfying. But it allows us to use, because um, like say Kurnots, three up save, 30 wounds. You have spells to make them come back and a war scroll that can make models come back. Now it's like, I'm going to use that teleport, not necessarily to charge, but to put them on this point where I maybe casted a spell to put a tree here. So now I have 12 wounds, 12 models on the objective because they're five wounds each. They're all in cover. And that is a three up save base and they smack back hard. So now Kurnos become not this yo-yo target that just like, if I don't get my spells off, that's 500 points wasted. They're now a threat on an objective that can maybe grind for a turn or two. Like you, you don't charge them in, sit them on the point, make you have to come into them. I punch back and then I, maybe I win the pry or not, but it, it's, it, it changes that it, we, you find us, I think maybe going more into bugs because we can find that mobility and more guaranteed charges there. Um, because, you know, 12 inch move with fly, 14 inch move with fly, you're going to be able to do what you need to do with them. Well, speaking of things that flies, hello. <laughs> <laughs> there's Ginger. There's, there's, there is your familiar. And someone else who has a familiar <laughs> is our new hero. So this is, yeah. in, this is coming in from Dawnbringers. Uh, it is guaranteed. It's it's locked into a current box right now. This uh, there's a Dawnbringer box that comes with Spice Swarm Hive. As a mm -hmm. Spice Swarm Hive. The, the, like, That'd be pretty crazy. I told you. I told you. <laughs> uh, the spite. Dude, dude. The, the spite lancers. Uh, it comes with the bugs and it comes with some some um, kernoths as well. So mm -hmm. I, I, I we we don't know when or if and how will be reboxed. We just know that it's currently in this box today. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Beth Belthanos, uh, the first thorn of Kernoth is this is the new hero, the one and only new war scroll in this book. Uh, there is a army of renown that we'll talk about in a second. So, um, Fred, you're going to give me some hot takes in a second. Let's go. <laughs> let's let's break this down. Let's yeah. break it down. So first off, move of 12, save of 3+, plus, bravery 9, and 14 wounds. Uh, 360 points, leader behemoth, single, and unique. So it has a characteristic and a points value very similar to uh, the spirit of Durthu. So uh, there's obviously a lot of differences there, but mm -hmm. just very, very basic at the start. Thoughts on move, save, bravery, wounds. I think it's pretty pretty yeah. decent. I mean, you you, you kind of hit it on the head. He, he's a tree lord as far as those characteristics are concerned with a 12-inch move, um, which kind of makes up for the fact that he doesn't get the tree lord teleport. 
Well, well, yeah, we'll talk about tree lot teleports in a second. We'll talk about teleporting in a second, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty consistent, you know, mm -hmm. good, num good numbers, 14 wounds, the, great the, nine. Yeah, solid combat profile. Well, um, let's talk the profile. So you've got two attack weapons. So mm -hmm. you've got a glaive with a range of two inches, four attacks, uh, a asterisk to hit. So it'll either be two, three, or four, depending on how many wounds it's taken. Mm -hmm. uh, threes to wound, Ren minus three for three damage. And then the uh, the beetle thing uh, is range two, <laughs> uh, four attacks, fours, threes, Ren two, four, uh, asterisks, anywhere from four to two damage. So... Talk to me about the melee profile and, you know, how does it compare to, let's say, Durthu? Again, very similar archetype build. Yeah. Um, as far as melee is concerned, it's a solid profile. I mean, that's a pretty good fighty hero, <laughs> I, you know. Um, outside of Durthu, our heroes are okay fighting, but this one just he kind of smacks. Um, you know, it's cool that they gave that Kurnoth Scythe Ren 3 onto him. Kind of flavorful. Um yeah, it's good beat stick profile. No, no shooting attacks, obviously. Mm -hmm. off. A, a Spirit of Durthu has that 15-inch Verdant Blast, mm -hmm. but you, mm -hmm. you have more attacks than Durthu. Yeah, you don't have the spike six damage, but as that degrades, it goes to less yep. damage, right? It, it becomes less yeah. consistent. The Ren 3 for me is hot. And yeah. the fact that, um, you know, the Kurnoth Glaive being a two up is hot. When yep. you do finest hour, you got to go twos, twos. Like it's. He also benefits from the Arch Rev aura. So the Arch Revenant has an aura that says all Kurnoth units, Kurnoth hunters with holy within 12 inches get plus one to wound when they attack. That's how you'll see those bows become, you know, twos to wound or Kurnoth become twos to wound. Um, so. Yeah, he benefits from that, and you know, with the Arch Rev command, he could have five attacks because the Arch Rev can give extra com um, extra attacks on all your profiles at the start of combat phase uh, if you're holding within twelve. So that that could be a really painful combination there, but just a a fun fighty hero that doesn't need an artifact like Durthu needs with the Greenwood Gladius to add D three more attacks. He just goes in, smacks someone up, poses like Orion, and just you know toots on his horn. I <laughs> love the quiet to Orion. The very first thing I saw for any Warhammer Fantasy Battles players is Orion, which is the uh, the spirit of Kurnoff, who mm -hmm. basically once a year uh, a wood elf would go into the forest, go, wrap themselves in the Oak of Ages, I think it was, and uh, would die and be uh, reincarnated as the as uh, Orion, the, 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 I guess the champion mm -hmm. of Kurnoff. So uh i love this uh, i do yeah. i do love the model oh it's so good what what, what bug and, do you think it is i don't know does that have common that is that like a, a baby version of alariel's bug or what, what, is that more of a is that more of the the lancer type bug like i'm i'm not I think yeah it looks more like like what the the revenant seekers and lancers have but way different because alariel's is definitively a beetle yeah yeah like this feels like a baby, but it's a it's a decent sized model. So I don't know. Like, I like fire. It. It's like Firefly or a cricket. I'm just imagining all the Tyranny players looking at this, going, "I need <laughs> this somehow in my my right." My... <laughs> or you could get like a, get a hive tyrant and put it on here instead of Kurna the belt or something. It's a, a Khan effects uh, <laughs> model. <laughs> By the way, good call out. The keywords are Order, Sylvaneth, Free Spirits, Hero, Monster, Kurnoff, Hunter, and Belthanos. So uh, the Kurnoff, Hunter keyword being a mm -hmm. critical piece here that you've called out a couple of buffs as well. Any other quick call outs about the keywords or should we get into some of the rules? Monster is good. <laughs> yes, good call out. So this is going to be important when we move into the Armies of Renown. So remember, it's a monster. No surprise, but we need to know this. Um I also think the damage table is very generous, so it's mm -hmm. only three le three levels, so it's not going to degrade too quickly, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. going to take just under half to start degrading. Yep. Cool. So it can fly, no surprise. Um, 14, 12, 12 inch move flies pretty pretty nice. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the second weapon profile is the mounts weapon profile. Just we just need to acknowledge that. 
let's get into the the juicy rules so first off nature etheric so in your hero phase you can pick one terrain feature within six inches of this unit and roll a dice on a three plus you pick one scenery rule from the mysterious terrain so that's your arcane mystical deadly yada 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 uh, and you apply that terrain rule for the rest of the battle but wait, Anthony, I go to tournaments and there's always tournament rules where there's mystical, arcane, deadly, either <laughs> set by the tournament organizer or it's set by the players when we are setting up the battle. What do I do here? Well, Anthony, good question because we've got an answer for you. If that terrain feature already has a scenery rule from the mysterious terrain table, the rule is replaced by the one you pick. The terrain feature is also considered to be yours uh, and to be, sorry, to be, to be overgrown Mm -hmm. um terrain feature so what hero phase we, we can change sure. basically we can change the rules on a terrain feature and we make it overgrown yeah fred what does it mean to you oh dude i love this rule this is to me that like this model the sick the war, war school is really cool has a lot of cool stuff but like this one this rule is as a johnny player there's a lot of weird stuff you can do with this um all of a sudden you know, that Awakened Wildwood, you can make Arcane. So now your w wizards that are chilling in there, now if it's a Warsong Revenant, can all of a sudden have a plus two, or your Branch Witches now are casting with a plus one because you just made your faction terrain Arcane. You can make a piece of terrain damned when you want to give some plus ones to hit without a command later on. Allows you to, mid-game, like you're in the middle of the board, you could say, this, like, for whatever reason, you have this huge piece of terrain or something, Three up, that's deadly you're going to walk through. Or that's sinister because I want to make sure that battle shock really hits. Or I'm going to make it damned or mystical if I want to six up ward for myself. So I think that this is a really fun rule just for that alone. Um, not as impactful as it could be in the future considering our current mysterious terrain rules. Some of them can be a bit lackluster. Inspiring, sinister have very strict limits. Um, mystical and arcane and damned are pretty good. Um you know, maybe maybe you ally in yourself as Pontifex, say, all right, there's your mystical. Go roll two ups for the rest of the game. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, with the Pontifex prayer to, to punch some wizards. But the other part of it becoming overgrown, huge. Um, just enabling your overgrowns, because your overgrowns are limited to being only terrain pieces that are wholly outside of your enemy's territory. Um, and especially now with, I think over a third of the battle plans have that full split down the middle, um, like, and every step is forward, uh, spring, the trap, I think has it like a lot of them have like a boom power flux. And so you can't, you're, you're really limited on where those overgrowns are going to be. But now Belthanos gets to say that one's overgrown as well, which also assists not just with overall Sylvan of game planning that's overgrown. Now I get to extend without having to cast a spell to give myself a tree. I'm going to be able to extend and charge you through that at that terrain piece and then dip out. So just it, it also this makes Everdusk and Tree Lords really good again in a way because Tree Lords mobility gets really kind of cut in half literally because they're a five inch move. They're relying on their War Scroll teleport where they have a teleport on their War Scroll. But if you can't put overgrowns in your opponent's territory on those maps, you're not doing anything or ever dust with their exploding sixes. But now Belthanos gets to extend your range for those armies. And it's just super cool that you get to just make things overgrown. <laughs> I think for me, the benefit is the upfront guarantee. Yeah. You, you, you need an arcane piece of terrain or a, yeah. uh, you need an extra award in your deployment zone from turn mm -hmm. one. Boom, mm -hmm. we can do that. You need that mm -hmm. extra piece of overgrown because the map is not favorable to you or the terrain is set up is not good for you. You can manipulate the board a mm -hmm. little bit better to start off. And then, as you said, depending on what you need, if you need to force, uh, like Cities of Sigma, a lot of low bravery, you need to force more battle shock. Boom, mm -hmm. let's turn some things sinister. You want to, um, let's say you get into a fire slayers and they're, and they're loving with their prayers or daughters of Cain are uh, taking advantage of the plus one to their, their chanting. Let's turn off, let's turn yeah. off a mystical. Let's turn off a mystical yeah. and make it something completely different. To, let's turn arcane for corn who are going to literally get no benefit. Yeah. Like yeah. there's just so much little, again, so cool. Chest. Yeah. Like, I, I, I did a little jump when I saw this rule. I was, this is, this rule is, I don't know. I don't think it's the best rule on him, but it's definitely my favorite rule on him. There are just so many cool things.
it's not obvious the benefit, but when you play around with it and you think about it strategically, mm -hmm. that's where the value is. On paper, yeah. you're like, okay, so what? Yep. It's, it's all right. Five up ward, so mantle of the leaves. So mathematically, you're getting about an extra five ish, mm -hmm. four, to four and a half to five wounds extra on, on yep. the hero. Um, like we, have, we don't get wards as an army. This just makes me happy. <laughs> It, it means you can commit this model to more combats mm -hmm. and know that it's going to be more durable. Um, yeah. You just, it's going to hang around longer. Yeah. Cool. Easy. All right. Yeah. Um, and next one, which is an interesting one. So this one is going to degrade as well. So 18, 12 or nine inch aura, depending on where you are on the damage table. So the Kurnothi Warhorn is friendly Sylvaneth units wholly within range of this ability can attempt to charge even if they ran in the same turn. If this is really cool, especially you know with bugs, extends their range even further. Your bug you, your bug models can just like really go and give someone a love tap before dipping out. Um, Kurnoths, you that that makes your Kurnoth unit. We were talking about how we don't want to rely on the battle mage or the spikes from Hive all the time. You can now like you know turn two after you've put them in the middle of the board or wherever you want them on the board. They're a five inch move, but now it's like I'm going to spend a command, eleven inch move they're now going to charge. And so like an 11 inch move Kurnoth, just like for the use of a command point is super strong. It used to be, we would have to have a war singer, which is a command trait to give everyone plus three to move their movement characteristic and a spice from hive on them. So a spell and a command trait given to give them an 11 inch move. But now it's like with Belthanos spend some command point. These boys are running. And then if, you know, if you really want to go crazy, bring the war singer, run them. It, it just, you, all of a sudden you had, you can have realistically Kurnoth's moving 14 inches and then charging you, which is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Or even something like your, um, what are they called? Uh, not tree revs, spike revs. Like being able to sling a bunch of spike revs early on yep. in the game. Like you could actually make a nice little horde clearer unit that's getting into combat super early save your uh, strike and fade for something else yeah. and have another unit of combat yeah uh, as like a one-two punch despite only having a strike and fade yeah it's by, yeah it's like that teleport economy is huge there because like you say you just i'm gonna yeet these guys in these guys got the spike storm so they're gonna make their six inch charge i paid 160 points for those 10 spike revenants they can die now let's get this break of kernoffs out it's just yeah or it could be bait and trap, right? Get them into copy, like charge them in. You know, hopefully they stay around and then retreat yep. them out the next turn yep. and then bring in the second. Yeah. Wave. Either way, I think we both like this and it probably yep. works well. As you said, the bugs super fast. Uh, oh, oh, a Lariel turn one charge. <laughs> oh, oh. She's oh. turn one charging anyways with a 16 inch move, but now it's 16 inch plus a run. So it could be 22 inches just in your face and then charge. Oh, dear Lord. Uh, <laughs> and I like that it's an 18-inch bubble because yeah. it keeps him out of danger when you don't want him to be in that, that threat zone. Anyone who remembers the Demon Prince of Corn from back in prior addition to Slaves of Darkness knows how big a 18-inch uh, aura really is. That is That takes up almost a good half of the table. Like that 18-inch aura will take yeah. up a big chunk. Yeah. Last rule is uh, the unending hunt. So you can use this command ability at the start of your movement phase. The unit that receives the command must be a Sylvaneth unit. Mm -hmm. That unit can retreat and charge later in the turn. Another good rule for us. It's like, again, we could, you know, you can throw something in that you know is going to probably survive until the next turn. And you just go and move it again. Or, you know, you could play for a double. Slam into that screen with some bugs. And then say you, you, you're you playing for that prior. You win the prior. I was like, all right, sweet. I'm now going to just retreat and fly over that screen and punch you again if you're too spread out. Or that, that kind of capitalizing on different things. Yeah, just, I, I it's, like it's, yeah, it's a lot of cool rules. And I think he's a really cool fighty support, a, a piece that can smack really hard, but a great support piece for tradition for normal Sylvaneth because – Especially for the, we have a lot of models that move just five inches that rely on their are teleporting to do anything that get enabled by a lot of these rules. And then 
you know, it's a lot easier for us to not get bogged down when we can just retreat and charge. So to summarize this particular model, um, overall, do you like it or do you not like it? I really like him a lot. Um, 360 feels a bit expensive to me personally, but that's more like when I compare to some other armies that get some really crazy support pieces for relatively cheap. But when you really think about it, it's 360, a monster, three up save, 14 wounds. So he's costed fairly appropriately. Um, I'd be okay with him being cheaper, obviously. But outside of that, I really like this model. Amazing looking model, really cool combat profile, and his buffs are super fun and a lot of really cool techie things you can do with them. And it seems like it enables your army to play in a lot of different ways. Like instead of now having the battle mage, we get him. <laughs> I think it's fair. I think when you compare it with Spirit of Durthu, who's 350, uh, I think you are on par. They do different things, but they are, are very mm -hmm. common in their kind of build. They're combat-y, they, they are a lot of wounds, you know, one has yeah. better movement, one can teleport, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I, I think it's fair. Mm -hmm. um, is this auto-include? I'm going to say no. I don't think it's auto-include, but it's a good choice. Yeah, I definitely agree. Am I going to include him in some list because the model's cool and I love playing with new toys? Absolutely. <laughs> but um, I do not think he's auto-include. Uh, like you said, because, you know, our lists don't need this to function. But like we talked about, like size versus swords, spite riders versus revenant seekers. What is going to enable what your list wants to do more uh, is what you're going to kind of be looking at. He has a lot of really cool tech and rules that are going to enable stuff certain styles of play even further and uh it just comes to down to take a look at your list what does your list want to accomplish how does it accomplish that and does this boy fit in that and and kind of help you accomplish that better um i i'm unless your a weakness of a list is really easy to shore up i'm always in favor of leaning into the strengths of your list especially when it comes to sylvaneth because there is always the potential to use your movement and maneuverability to kind of work around a situation um, to try and outplay potentially, or at least use your mobility to play safer so to mitigate your weaknesses on the table as opposed from list construction. So Belthanos, I think, will enable a lot of different lists more and increase their, improve their strengths as opposed to using them to try and shore up some weaknesses in other ones. Bingo. What That was literally what my summary was going to be. Belthanos brings a different style, a less yeah. reliance to strike and fade, mm -hmm. and it may unlock some different ways to play your army, whether mm -hmm. it is um, some extra speed on those slower units, whether it's enhancing the speed through the faster units, whether mm -hmm. it is a one-two punch where you still have strike and fade, but you've now got a second yeah. consistent offensive move, um, unit that you can strike and fade and punch, or if the strike and fade fails because you didn't get off the spite swarm hive, you've got an alternative to like increase the movement. There's a lot of cool tech here that I yeah. yeah I think we both agree it's not an auto include, uh, and you'll have to find 360 points from somewhere. Yeah, yep. And we are in we are an army that really likes every point we can get because uh, we're a pretty pricey army. Cool. I'm going to stop here for a second. I want everyone to close their mind because there's now a whole new way to play Sylvaneth. Fred, are you ready? Absolutely. A whole new way. And, and there's going to be some sticker shock for some people because they're like, whoa, wait a second. I've lost something. So <laughs> armies of renowned. Armies of renowned are basically a way to build your Sylvaneth list. Now, there are some strict rules where you can't use your grand strategy, you can't use your battle tactics. Uh, there's a couple of other things that you can't use from the Sylvaneth Allegiance ability, like your War Scroll Battalions, for example. Uh, what else? What else can't you use? Um, Enhancements. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, yeah, there's a couple of things, basically. So you're going in with some limitations mm -hmm. the other other limitation you see on top of the screen is uh sorry i should read this out i was, I was looking for what I, <laughs> I, was look, I was looking for what i wrote to you so <clears throat> <laughs> no the allegiance abilities of an army of renowned place the replace the allegiance abilities of the faction it belongs to 
In addition, the following rules from the uh, from the faction's battle tomes are not used. So grand strategies, battle tactics, core battalions, and war scroll battalions. You can still include your faction terrain, which is wonderful, uh, and each army of renown will list the units that you can include. You can't use allies. So you'll see at the top of the screen here, the evergreen hunt says when you build a Sylvaneth list using an evergreen hunt, you can only use units that have the Sylvaneth keyword, obvious, and they must have either Arch Revenant, Kurnoth Hunters, Revenant Seekers, Spite Raider Lancers. Uh, all units then gain the Evergreen Hunt. So, Fred, what does that mean? What, what, am, I, what am I trading just at this point in time? So, Alariel, mm -hmm. for example, can't use Alariel. You know Wizards, which keeps us away from our spell lore. Um, which is a very useful spell lore. We have a lot of great spells there. Even though their casting values are really high and we don't have much bonuses to cast, that's that feels bad. <laughs> and then, you know, the obvious... Uh, no tree lords. So our mm -hmm. fight last and our no pile-ins and the free tree and dirt, it's all gone. And, you know, the big obvious one is no more teleporting. Um, like, you know, strike and fade from the woodland paths, that rule, gone. As well as... Um, we, we can't cast tree. The Verdant Blessing is gone as well. We not we can't just summon trees where we want them to be. Um, and our seasons. So we have our four seasons, um, burgeoning, uh, uh, everdusk, reaping, and uh, dwindling, which give us nice little kind of bonuses are completely gone here. Um, yeah. So we, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we lose. Well, you'd also and tree reps. Well, and you also lose your sub faction, so you can't do open yeah. brow, you can't do heartwood, mm -hmm. you can't do. Um, it's not all loss. I just want to kind of like set the set the scene to say, mm -hmm. right, well, you can't use your uh, Lady of Vines, you can't use your Tree mm -hmm. Lord variant, you can't use a War Song, you can't use Dryads, you can't use. There's a lot of things that you know you can't use. All right, so we're building around Archrev, Kurnoff Hunters, mm -hmm. Revenant Seeker. Spite Raider Lances. That's what we're building around. Yeah. And that's all three types of current health hunters. No limits on those. Correct. Cool. So what do I get for this trade? And I guess what we're going to do now is go through the rules, to say what we like, what we don't like, and then mm -hmm. compare them to the current rules. And then Fred is going to explain a bit more about how we are building our lists in GHB 23. So we know our restrictions. Uh, to honor Kurnoth, friendly evergreen hunt units that don't have the hero keyword have battle line, battlefield roles. Dope. They're, they're battle line. <laughs> we can reinforce them to nine models. <laughs> Great. So, so because you, your Kurnoth hunters, for example, are only battle line in yeah. hardwood. Uh, yeah. use Revenant Seekers are battle line in... Uh, Harvest Boon. Both, both of the bugs, Spy Riders and Rev Seekers. Cool. So basically, we're unlocking these as battle line. So you can reinforce them to nines if you want to reinforce them to nines. Mm -hmm. uh, no other real benefit here? Uh, I mean, so there, there's a list I always enjoyed. It was actually, I saw it on um, one of your videos when the book first came out last year. I remember watching uh, the, uh, I think it was with Jeremy or Jeremy. Oh, was it Laurie? Laurie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, sorry, I can't remember the name right. Uh, but it was, they had a list where they had nine Revenant Seekers in a brick and just kind of move them up the board and they're like, oh, you broke the middle. I'll just get rid of these. These guys go to rally on fives. It doesn't work as much anymore because of the rally limitation, but um, still a very fun idea in my opinion. <laughs> nine bugs could be really entertaining, but uh, getting being able to get them to six is kind of what you need. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're going to reinforce. And obviously, you know, you, you've lost your your basic um, battle line units anyway. So, mm -hmm. uh, cool. All right. Very simple one. Um, but where we start getting some interesting rules, and they kind of mm -hmm. actually all connect. So, uh, rhythm connects to harmony. So, mm -hmm. rhythm of the chase. After deployment, before the players have determined who will take the first turn, uh, you can pick one enemy unit on the battlefield to be the quarry. If the quarry is destroyed at the start of your next hero phase, you can pick one enemy unit to be the new quarry. All right, so we're targeting one unit, uh, and then when that unit dies, 
we can target another unit. So no restriction on hero or monster or size of unit. It's just pick one unit quarry. Fred, anything you'd call out initially before we move into the harmonies? Um, that's we talk about how like skill expressive this army is, how we're running on a knife's edge. The wrong quarry could be real, could feel really bad. Um, just because it's like, oh, you know, say the opponent goes first, and I'm in that turn, I'm picking this dumb little this dumb this this unit over here. And the opponent's like, all right, sweet, you're never touching this unit. Um, it's it, my I, my first thought is like try and find squishy stuff that you can clear out. Um, obviously, but also like maybe I could pick the thing where it's like, I know you want this unit to go here and do a thing. I'm going to make it beneficial for me to kill that. Cause I know we're going to be having a punch up together if that's there, but it, it's, it could, especially with how much this army of renown hinges on you getting these quarries. It's it, picking the right one is going to be a big, important skill test. My advice to everyone is don't pick the obvious answer. You're going to get to the table. Mm -hmm. You're going to see Archeon. You're going to see Catacross. You're going to see uh, the Bloodthirster. You're going to see these big bads, and you know you want to get rid of Lord yeah. Croak. And you're going to go, I want to make the Lord Croak the quarry. That's the wrong choice. Yeah. At least, at least early on in mm -hmm. your first, say, two to three rounds, that is the wrong choice. Fred, you nailed it. Pick squishy things that are going to die quickly. You can, mm -hmm. you can chip them off from range and, and kill those five or ten wound idiot units with a low yep. save. Yep. You're going to clear them anyway because they were going to be sitting on an objective early. You want to start racking up these points. Yeah, and then you also want to think about the benefits you get from being near the quarry. I mean, we haven't quite read it yet, but things to kind of keep in the back of your head. We get benefits from being in the same quarter as the quarry. We All get right, benefits me, from being. Me, let, yeah. Let me read it. Let me read it. Don't ruin yeah. Christmas. All right. Yeah. yeah so, sorry. Um, sorry. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's I ruined Christmas. Christmas. That's all right. We'll tell, we'll tell little Timmy he's not going to get a present. Um, oh, no. Little Timmy's definitely not getting Strike and Fade in his Christmas box for the end of the <laughs> But, you, but you, you, you're right. Okay, so we've picked our quarry and we know who we're targeting, whether it's a squishy or a hero. If you've got big grapefruits, you go for Archaeon. So at the start of each <laughs> battle, uh, at, sorry, at the start of the battle, after priority has been made, each player commanding an evergreen hunt. Uh, so they should say at the start of each battle round. Yeah. Battle round. I'll fix that on in, in post-production. At the start of each <laughs> battle round, after the priority roll has been made, each, pl each player commanding an evergreen hunt army must determine their hunting harmony for the battle round, starting with the player whose turn is, to is taking first. Mm -hmm. A hunting harmony is made up of a number of chords. You start with zero chords and you receive one chord for the following. So if you have a friendly Balthanos on the battlefield, for each friendly evergreen hunt unit, that is wholly within the same large quarter as the battlefield of the quarry. So not each battle every quarter, it's just purely the quarter of where the quarry is. Last is uh, for each quarry destroyed during the battle. So add up the number of chords you receive and consult the hunting harmony table to see which effect applies for that battle round. These effects are cumulative. So if you have six chords, all of the table will apply. The hunting harmony chords are lost at the end of each battle round. So we're collecting points. Mm -hmm. At the end of every battle round, it, uh, it it resets. It is cumulative, so I get more benefits, more points I score. Fred, what does this all mean so far? Um. It means like that. That's where like we were talking about how choosing the right quarry can be very helpful because, you know, yeah, I want to kill this unit, but there is benefit. You might actually get more harmony for being picking the one that's like these guys are in the same quarter as like four of my three of my units. So then, that's three harmony right off the bat, and a fourth because you have Belthanos. So there's there's a lot of different play there. It's not just something you want to kill. It's something you want to be around in general. Um, something to kind of point out here is you pick a new quarry at the start of your next hero phase if it is destroyed. So that's something to keep in mind. Like you're not picking a new one outside of something we'll get into later. Um, 
unless the quarry is destroyed. And there is an interesting timing thing there, because if you kill the quarry, you're going to get your harmony count. Say you're going first in the next round, you're going to get your harmony count before you pick your next quarry. So you could have maybe killed something that's around five of your units. So you got five harmony for being in the same quarter as them. And then you killed that unit at the end of turn two. You go into the next round when you would have had five or six harmony. Now you just have two because you have a Belfinos and a quarry destroyed. And so then you just kind of maybe limited yourself, hamstrung yourself a little bit because you couldn't pick a new quarry before harmony was determined at the start of the battle round. But don't forget that as you're killing, you know, if you can kill this quarry every turn, mm -hmm. you're racking up that baseline because you've got three, you know, you, you turn mm -hmm. two, let's say it's turn three, you've killed two quarries because you've yeah. killed two units of, of cheap screens. You started with two, Belthanos is on three. And now then you're getting to the juicy stuff. Correct. So yep. we understand this much. We pick, a, we pick a hero or a unit or whatever it is. It's a quarry. We rack up some points based on the archetype and where models are on the table. We have these chords. So let's talk about the chords. If I've got no, if I've got zero chords, it means there's no effect. Move forward. If I have one chord, uh, you get to add one to run and charge rolls for friendly units wholly within the same quarter of the battlefield as the quarry. Fred, that's good. <laughs> I mean, we were talking about how much Belthanos enables with that run and charge. It just enables it more. Um, yeah. Getting that plus one to run, plus one to charge um, fixes a lot of potential issues. Oh, you redeploy. No, I only need an eight if you redeploy six. Or maybe I could hit something else. I like that. It, it, it There is something to keep in mind, though, wholly within the same quarter of that quarry. So it just kind of really comes down to picking the right target not just for what you want to kill but for what you want to gain the benefits from being there yeah yeah spot on uh so uh i mentioned it's cumulative so as we get into the second mm -hmm. one i don't lose the plus one and plus one a uh, plus one and run and charge i actually mm -hmm. gain them so it's almost like daughters of Cain, where your blood rights are gaining as you mm -hmm. go throughout the battle round for anyone who's played against daughters so uh if you have two chords you get to add plus one to hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks made with melee weapons that target an enemy unit wholly within the same large quarter as the battlefield uh, of the battlefield as the quarry. Yeah, that's that's juicy. Uh, getting that, and you know, depending on whether that is like the enemy needs to be within that quarter of the quarry, or you need to be wholly within the quarter of the quarry. Either way, like getting that benefit feels so good. We, you know. Kurnos hitting on three twos and twos is always like the ideal dream you're trying to set up and you just get it without having to have your arch rev bubble near them. Or, you know, rev seekers have always been gimmitted, gimped by limited, gimped, same time, gimmitted by the, uh, the fact that they hit on fours. Um, but now you can make them threes, twos with a brick of six of them. That's 19 attacks, threes, twos, rend two, two damage. And then it's like, all right, Arch Revenant Command. That's four attacks each, 25 attacks, threes, twos, red and two, two damage with a two inch reach and a six inch pile in. And then as we get to the next one, as you're going to see, you know, we could get even spicier. <laughs> cool. So now we're getting plus one to run, plus one to charge, plus one to hit, plus one to wound. This is getting pretty consistent. This is quite nice. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the middle spot, which I imagine most people are going to live in, is this um, three to five. So uh, add plus one, uh, sorry, add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly units while they are within three inches of the quarry. Yeah, I mean, in this again, quarry selection is so important. Do you know you're going to be fighting around it? You could pick a screen. And this could be bugs. You're hopping over that screen to fight the thing behind it if they left a little room for you. Or you're looking to fight the thing next to the screen, say, with some Kurnos or anything. And so now, with that art, you know, swords are already four attacks each. Five attacks each now by just being within three inches of whatever you pick to be your quarry. And then with an arch rev command, six attacks, plus one to hit, plus one to wound. It just balloons in effectiveness and just lifting things up. And the coolest part is where usually we would have to get spells off to be able to get some of these crazy combos. Now it is, it's a pilot thing. It's a skill thing where you have to, you no longer feel beholden to your spell casting roles and your opponent's spell casting roles. 
I know if I make the right choice, if I study up and make the right choice of quarry and make sure I move just the right way and do my target selection just right, I'm just going to blow things up out of the water with these units that punch incredibly hard. What I love about this is turn one, I pick that screen idiot unit. I delete it. Turn two, where I know I'm going to go into that juicy target, that vampire lord on zombie dragon, yep. whatever is annoying me, that combat threat. Yep. Assuming that I've killed the quarry in turn one, I've still got Balthanos on table. And then all of a sudden, like I'm basically going to be very easily, uh, and even if I've got one unit in the same quarter as where the quarry is, I'm on three. You're, you're where you want to be. You're there. I'm on, I'm on three, and I can go slap consistently with that plus one attack. So mm -hmm. um, it gives me a lot of great – because I don't need to, like, do some shenanigans and, you know, try to attack the screen and then try to pile in, stay within the screen, and then try to t attack the real bad guy. Actually, I've just racked up enough points very early on, whether it's a turn yeah. two or even a turn three strike. If I've got uh, two quarries dead and Balthanos, that's three. That's all I need, and I've got that consistent plus one attack, mm -hmm. as well as plus one to hit, plus one to wound, plus one to run, plus one to charge. It's That's so spicy. nice. That's it, spicy. It's, it's so spicy. And it's like, I love how skill expressive it is, because like we say, picking the right quarry is key, because it, it, it's interesting, because it feels like, to me, you almost don't want to kill a quarry, um, depending on the situation which is where that skill expression comes down, where it's like, do I want to kill it, rack up that permanent point from now until the end of the game? Love it, perfect. Or do I want to keep this thing alive because I just want to be near it so I can punch things super hard. Super. I think I, I think I want to kill it. I think turn one and maybe turn two, depending on again, yeah. the flow of the battle. Turn one, turn two, I'm trying to kill the thing. Yeah. And then turn three, I want to pick that really durable target that I want to pull down. I want to put a focus on and use that plus one attack to to its full advantage. Mm -hmm. That's how I would do it, but I'm not the Silver Death player. Um, I well that actually plays more into kind of the traditional Silver Death game plan of pick off the screen, pick off the screen, do something meaty. It's just, it's interesting because I can see that working really well because we have a lot of, like, Spite Rider Lancers are good trading pieces, potentially. 190 points, pick up the dumb screen. I get, and then it's like, all right, you're going to kill 190 points, but if they live, I'm going to bring them back with Rally and all that stuff on five ups. And so then you just kind of pull them out and you cycle something else in. The The interesting part is when you're compared, that the compared to the normal Sylvaneth, when we have that normal Sylvaneth game plan is we're not dipping out. We're here to party when we put something into you now. We're not just run away. <laughs> it's funny, actually, because the way I'm thinking about it in my head is having a unit of Kurnoth Hunters with great bows that are going to take out the screens early mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I might still have some of those um, those bugs that go in and clean up if they don't do yep. enough damage. But turn one, I'm, uh, turn one, maybe even turn two, those Kurnoths are just chipping away. Yeah guaranteeing me that I kill that yep. quarry. And then uh, as the rest of my army's moving forward, they've wrapped enough points. I don't want to see yep. myself early turn one. Yeah. But I definitely want to be, I don't want to rely on killing the quarry in turn one because I may not get those screens and I might be over committing those kernels mm -hmm. or those big block of bugs yep. to get one point. And then the next turn, it's like, ah, I'm in the quarter of them. I get the points anyways. And I, I think you really hit it on the, like something I love about how what you just said there, because I'm talking about like you know what I would do if I have bugs or maybe some kern off to throw in to get the early harmony points, but the whole dynamic changes if you have kern off with bows completely, and that just kind of nails home just how cool Sylvaneth is. Really, like two com like two completely different ways of approaching the puzzle of the quarry in the Evergreen Hunt. Just from like, ah, it's Kurnos with bows instead of swords. It just changes the dynamic of everything. It's just why Sylvaneth rules. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> this is going to be hard not to be a Sylvaneth player. I've already been a Sylvaneth player once. I've, I've, anyone listening to my show has known that I was a Sylvaneth player once. I built 15 Kurnos in a heartwood. And then Heck yeah. uh, I picked, I, no, no, I picked up my battle tone from Games Workshop that day. And then that night, Cities of Sigma book one was revealed. 
and like mm. it never it never come unwrapped mm. never come unwrapped unfortunately um mm. but i do have a deep love for kurnos i do have a deep love um and actually funnily enough i was rebuilding i've actually got the original orion that i was gonna make as my Ooh. spirit or i was gonna make it as my spirit of kurnos um i was gonna manipulate it to it to a degree but now i don't have to i've got bell Thanos. Yeah, or you just put him on the bug, you know? <laughs> like, I think, I don't know if it was beforehand or during this episode you talked about, just put Orion on the bug. Do not threaten me with a good time. The last one, really quickly, is we have um, six chords. So if you've got six chords, uh, while a friendly unit is wholly within the same large quarter of the battlefield as the quarry, it's eligible to fight in the same combat phase uh, if it is within six inches of the quarry instead of three. And it can move an uh, extra three inches when it piles in. This is the good pile-in. This is the good version of 16 yeah. pile-in. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us at this point have been made very sad by a bunch of dire wolves running up and then being able to just say, nah, you're in combat now. But it's like... Pause, pause, because people might not know this. Oh, so true. Frank, what, People might not know this. So I, I mentioned cheekily there's a good six-inch pile-in and a bad six-inch pile-in. Yeah. It, can you explain this yeah. using the dire wolf as an example and how yeah. that relates to Sylvaneth? Absolutely. So dire wolves, uh, so we'll, we'll start with the bugs. Bugs have a the bad, air quotes, bad six-inch pile because six-inch pile is still good, where you still have to be within three inches of the enemy in combat range, in engagement range, to then... I can now fight. I am. In t I get to activate the fight. I'm going to have a pile in that can be six inches. Where so that's what's traditional? That's traditional pile in rules. So I have to be yeah. within three inches to be eligible to fight, mm -hmm. and then I pile in three. But the bugs allow you to pile in six. So yeah, uh, I've got to be within three. Pile in six. So I basically get more movement in my pile in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then we're like the dire wolves, and what we see here with this rule is you get to be. In combat, you're counted as in engagement range and in combat when you're within six inches of an enemy. So then I'm within six inches of you, and now I'm going to pile in six because I get to be tagged in combat. What this opens up, um, to bring it back to Sylvaneth, what you could do is I could be like, okay, bugs, uh, spite rider lancers, auto run 20 inches up the board, and I don't even have to make a charge if they end within six inches of an enemy unit. Or I could make the charge if I want to. Um it just it's now eligible to fight and then they get to make their pile it's just super super strong to be able to take out a bit of uh, the randomness of charges but it also it sells your opponent that's it's like hey if i'm at six harmony you know how like you normally have a three inch bubble you can't you can't move through but you also don't want to end up in because of the the you cannot end up in there because of engagement range but now that's a six inch bubble that i'm saying if you're within six inches of this in your combat phase i could choose to activate them to fight you or i could choose to activate them so i'm just gonna not even be in combat with you i'm just gonna tag this point because i now get a six inch pile and to move on to this point with these bodies or i'm going to tag you just barely tag you within three inches so <clears throat> after like so they're gonna fight maybe corner tag you but then i have the retreat and charge command so it's free movement and then if you add this on top of the bugs you already get a six inch pile in you'll notice it says an extra three inches. It doesn't say they get a six inch pile in, which means bugs are now activating within six inches of the enemy and piling in nine inches with fly. <laughs> oh, I, I wasn't even thinking that. Here I am thinking lowbrow. I'm going, oh, okay, so if Belthanos is injured and that Warhorn bubble goes from 18 to nine, okay, they can still get Super around. Super good this. still. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm think I'm thinking like level one type stuff here, or I'm thinking about oh okay, well uh, it allows me to basically get in combat without having to punch first because I think one of the challenges is when mm -hmm. you have multiple combats with Sylvaneth, you don't want to get punched. So yeah, what, yeah. What you can do is you can punch with the the Kurnoth hunters. You could punch with uh, that really juicy thing, and then you can let the, the sequence go through and then go in with the spite revs for the spite revs um the the spite lances to go in and um and, and attack yeah i'm thinking something a bit more fragile or maybe, maybe yeah. less less yeah. of an armor save yeah, say fragile, yeah, yeah. Less, less of an armor save yeah and not and that that unit's already fought so then you pile in and you do more damage yep and it's like you know oh like we could use revenant seekers here who hit way hard well 
Spite Riders have volume of attacks. Rev Seekers have punchier attacks when it comes to their combat profile. And so it's like, say we have our Rev Seekers. I put the, you know, 18 inch move potentially with an auto run of six inches, put them where I want to put them. Um, now they're going to activate within six. Like you said, Kurnots are going to go do their thing. A Spite Rider Lancer unit, which has fight first in the charge, are going to go and do their thing. And then the opponent has, you know, engaged all that stuff and it's the end of combat and i'm going to be like fight this nine inch pile and i'm going to use that to take a point that may have been space that may have been freed up because i cleared something or just finish something off and they're hitting on threes and twos because they're in the same quarter as the quarry potentially i will say there is an interesting sequencing thing here because they are eligible to fight so this would be a check your, with your TO or with your local rules expert um, situation because if they're eligible to fight, do they have to fight when it is your turn to fight or can you just wait to choose them to fight? I'm not too certain of that. I've never used the good six inch pile in that much, but there is the potential there of like, can you wait you until the end of combat or it's no, like. No, no, you have. You, you, if you've got no more eligible units to fight, you would have to. You can't because it's not an end of combat sequence. Yeah, you yeah. You, you, yeah, you have to. Um, by, the way, so, by the way, by the way, I just want to. I want to remind everyone that we are recording literally on day one, so things might get eroded. They mm -hmm. might think that that nine inch pile in might be a bit too <laughs> aggressive. So just. It, it's it's really good right now, but just know that if you're watching this in the future, hello future self, uh, just know that this may be changed. But uh, <laughs> like like at the moment, ninety and like I was just rereading it. There's that that's being triggered off the standard bearer of the uh, yes. revenant seekers. That and the spite rider lancers. Like that's crazy. A nine inch pile. Right. Like, Let me have it. I want it so badly. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to, to to charge a screen and then pile in and like okay crazy crazy cool crazy well, cool. It's, it's, yep and it, there's also like we said like oh i clear the screen they're still having that extra three inches and they pile in they don't have to be within six inches of something so when you charge you're just gonna nine inch pot it's just insane cool all right so we've acknowledged it it goes up plus one to run plus one to charge plus one to hit plus one to wound plus one attack uh, six inch pile in, or sorry, an extra three inch uh, with a whole bunch yep. of extra shenanigans. So, uh, cords are basically what you're trading um, to not take uh, strike and fade, the seasons, some of the other things. Mm -hmm. A couple of other things before I get Fred's summary and, uh, you know, do we run with this or do we run with our traditional builds? A couple of other things. We've still got our overgrown rules. I don't know if this is any very different. Uh, but it's... you have the basically you pick three terrain features uh, outside your territory and they are overgrown. That's the same rule, right? Yes, that part is the same. As is the next part. It's do you want to read it or <laughs> just, just slightly different? So at the start of your hero phase, you heal one uh, yep. wound allocated to each friendly evergreen. Hunt. Yeah, that's wholly within nine inches of an overgrown terrain feature. Yeah, yeah. so it, it's the, we, we have that already. Which is just like the you know you know how your Sylvaneth player is like ah, I'm just healing one everywhere across the board in a way the anti Nurgle, um, I, I always love how thematically different like contrasting they are. Here's your disease at the end of the turn. I'm going to heal one at the beginning of the turn, but um, just fun thing there. Notably, no teleports tied to those overgrowns, no seasons, so no ever dusk on those overgrowns. This this army for now would be insane if you're allowed to take it with ever dusk, in my opinion. Making something overgrown with Belthanos. I don't care about the teleport. It's just gravy. Kurnoth's turning objectives into overgrowns. Just, it would get pretty crazy. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, it, we're just healing. It's just a nice little, like, here's a one wound. But wait, there is more. So we mentioned earlier that you don't get your uh, allegiance, grand strategies, battle tactics, command traits. So what you do get is you get a couple of extra rules. So first off, you get a heroic action and you get a monstrous rampage. So the heroic action at the start of the hero phase, yada, yada, you know how to do a heroic action. <laughs> evergreen heroic, uh, evergreen hunt hero. Cool. So uh, what do you get? You get a prize quarry is sighted. Pick one friendly evergreen hunt hero and one enemy unit within nine inches of that hero. That enemy unit becomes the quarry instead of the enemy unit that was picked to be the quarry. 
nice little quarry reset. It's like, I don't, I'm not destroying that screen, whatever. It's done its job. I'm going to pick this one. Really solid at end of turn two for if you're going second as well. If, you know, for some reason they're within nine of you, just like, that's the quarry now. Going to do my things. But now without even killing that quarry, I can set up next turn to have a million harmony or... I now have chosen this quarter is the party quarter. We're going to get all those bonuses that I have stacked up with my harmony by being in this quarter with this dude. I'm just thinking in my head, and maybe this is an FAQ for Games Workshop. So, turn let's say you know, let's say it's turn one. I've killed ten chameleon, t- ten skinks. I've mm-hmm. shot them off with my bows. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Tick the box. I score it. Uh, I lose prio. Uh, I lose priority, and it's now, you know, my opponent's turn. I use this heroic. I use this heroic action to then change the skinks who are dead to be something else, to be a new quarry. I wonder if I can do that. So, do I still count as having scored it because I killed the skinks, even though they're not the quarry now? And then, does it allow me to stack up extra quarry points early on? In order to like, it, am I, or am I on a weird tangent? I, I I think so. I think that's how we want it to work, where it's like quarry is stacked at the start of the first hero phase of a round, or something like that. Like that would make sense. But if I, I if I remember right, it says at the start of a battle round after priority rolls, which happens before the first hero phase, I believe. That's when you start tallying your harmony for the round. Yeah, so let's say it's another round, right? Let's say it's let's say it's the let's say it's turn two, right? Turn two, mm-hmm. quarry. I kill it at the top of the turn two. Then in your at the bottom of the turn two, I then change it. That's where it gets real spicy, yeah. Because that, then that, it's that's, like that's what I'm thinking. That's what it doesn't yeah. matter when when we do it. I'm just thinking about the sequence yeah. order. Yeah, is, could that get me a bunch of extra quarry points if I yes. switch the quarry? Score mm-hmm. the point because it's destroyed. Get another quarry target, yeah. and then yeah. So I'd say top of turn one, you go kill those dumb chameleon skinks or whatever. Right? Well, chameleon skinks are gonna be out there. You, got, you you kill the dumb screen turn one, and then your hero after your first turn is in range for whatever reason. So then you take the heroic action, pick a new one, and that's loaded up for your next round because they went bottom of the turn. So now the next round, start of round, that quarry is picked because you pick. And that's where the quarry selection gets really interesting and intricate because you're not stacking up the points in your hero phase. You're stacking it up start of battle round after priority roll. And I think to your point as well, very early on when we talked quarries, if that person then tries to avoid the fight, moves it around and, you know, becomes mm-hmm. really difficult to, to maybe they move into a completely different quadrant where your army's moving. We're going, okay, cool. This, this has become too hard. I can swap it out to something or yeah. maybe I lose an objective and I need to shift my army towards this part of the board. Cool. Mm-hmm. I pick a different quarry to match where my army wants to move. And it's like a little reset. Yeah, I, I also think there's interesting mind games to be played there as well. Because if you pick the quarry to be something your opponent wants to, like whatever point in the game wants to like get frisky with, and you just say, that's the quarry. If you don't move that away from me next turn, nine inch pylons, you know, with, with a billion attacks, threes, twos, you know, or twos, twos, a billion attacks, because you the unit you pick to be the quarry is the unit the opponent wants to go in. And by putting that unit in, I'm now getting all of these benefits for starting the next round in the same quarter as that dude. Mm. Could be interesting for some spell casting savants where you're like, cool, I'm going to target that wizard. The wizard retreats and tries to kind of be away from your army. Actually, that plays in your favor because, uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. Or it's like, hey, that's a nice group of 10 chosen there that just decided to kill my spite riders I just put in the way. Thanks for everything. <laughs> And it, but that, that's like an interesting mind game because if the opponent isn't scared of you lifting their piece off the board or if they don't care, like a bunch of zombies, uh, then it, then it's kind of useful. But it, that, that's a matchup dependent. It, it's, it just comes to like kind of the skill, uh, some of the skill stuff of the army as well. Yeah, some interesting things. I, I think there might be a minor clarity, some, some of the crazy yeah. things that I'm thinking about with like how you move yeah. your sequence around to like rack up some really quick mm-hmm. points on the quarry because it could be done. But whether it stays like that in a couple of weeks' time, we'll see. Yeah, it's like you say, this this, this army that wants to, that this army of renown that 
on the surface wants to just push models forward, go do things, still has a lot of that 4D chess component that you've talked about before. I'm just like, mind games, that core, do I want it alive because I have a lot of units in the same quarter of it? Or do I just want to lift it because late, there's a lot of that 4D chess stuff? It's just you, a different 4D chess. Because <laughs> you could go screen, screen, say turn one, screen, turn two, screen, then bottom of turn two, swap it to juicy target because now you've got yep. already still on the table. You've racked up two points. Yep. You go for the reset in turn three. You've now got two yep. plus. Like, you, like, like, like you, you're... Yeah. yeah, like you're playing to ramp up. You're like, okay, first couple turns, I'm just going to play base Sylvaneth with no teleport, with Belfanos giving whatever he did gives. But then come turn three on, because I got those two early, I am terrifying to fight with anything for the next... Potentially three. Like if you killed one turn one, and if basically what I've got in my mind is can I kill two quarries in turn two? Turn one... As I say, uh, top of turn two, and then bottom of turn two by switching the quarry, I'm now on three, and then I mm. start that around three with three kill plus Balthanos, yep. plus a couple of things in the quarter. Yep. I'm now on I'm on six. Yep. It just it gets. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking in my it's head. But so many cool things. It's like it's and it's you're right. Like there's so many different ways and paths to play with it that could feel matchup dependent. It could feel list dependent from your side and your opponent. I, I'm just so excited to get this on the table and try out all the different variations of situations here because it could just do so many different things a couple more things you get a monstrous rampage so remember we said earlier remember that balthanos is monster there's no other monsters you can't get a mm -hmm. Mariel, you can't get your tree lord variants there's no monsters only balthanos uh so the the monstrous rampage you can execute instead of any others raw stomp la 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 um merciful strike so if the quarry has any wounds allocated to it and is within three inches of this unit, roll a dice and add the number of wounds allocated to the quarry to the roll. If the result is greater than the quarry's wound characteristic, one model in that unit is slain. This screams to me bone offs because it just, I, I, I mean, spite riders go do their things and then in a later turn you can lift something potentially, but I'm just like, Chuck, say it's KO. I'm going to chuck a lot of bow knots into those gun haulers with their new army of renown. Charge in Belthanos. Well, have some spite riders eat the double unleash help. Then charge in Belthanos. <laughs> that, say that that gun hauler has like eight wounds on it. I just, I'm going to do the monster's rampage. Your gun hauler's dead. And now I'm going to fight the other gun hauler. So it, it's, I, that, that's like the first thing that pops up in my head of just like shoot your bows at like a monster or something with a lot of wounds and then just have your buddy come up and it's dead because on a two up, I'm going to kill it because like eight plus two is 10 boom done yeah. or eight plus three. It'd be a three up. So in that scenario. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think to myself in my head, do I use this or do I use a stomp? Now I'd obviously against a monster. I can't stomp a monster, uh, but like this, I'm, I'm trying to think like there's some situations mm. where Stomp is going to be the better or Titanic Jewel might be the better. Mm -hmm. um, it's this is this is a very interesting one. Like yeah. it's not it's not super powerful. It's interesting, but to your point, it's about quarries and being chipped away at the quarry. And I guess it depends on who you're going at. Do they have a ward save? Are you are you willing yeah. to risk the dice rolls of you know two up and then the D three? Yeah. Or, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. How much damage even, to the quarry? Yeah, I didn't even think about that. It, I because I saw this and I didn't even catch the quarry part. It being tied to the quarry does, yeah. So it's it's a good situational play, but definitely not something you're gonna want all the time. As you said, I no. think I think I think you hit it on the head there. Keep it up your sleeve. It's interesting, but. And because you're not going to have multiple monsters, it's not like you can do stomp and you've got yeah. something. Like, as a Suns player, there's times where I want multiple stomps. I can't do it. This would yep. be great. But but you've only got one in Balthanos. So. Yeah. If they allow Tree Lords, though. <laughs> yeah, completely different story. Completely different story. Yep. You have one command trait, one artifact, one grand strategy, three mm -hmm. new battle tactics. Starting at the top, your command trait is Sapwood Leader. When you use the Abundant Growth command trait to heal, so that's our healing with an Overgrown, uh, you heal D3 instead of 1. Thoughts? Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, if you're wanting to put an Arcane Tome on an Arch Rev, spoiler, I might have done that. <laughs> uh, to go spellcasting Savant, this is nice counter to 
Comets Call, a Pontifex, just like D3 without having to use a heroic, lead, heroic recovery or in conjunction with heroic recovery based on what the turn demands. It's it, not the worst thing in the world. You're, you know, you're not going to have many wizards for many useful command traits from the GHB. Eater of Magic could be funny, but <laughs> where you roll a five up, haha, no spell for you, but I, I it's it's fine. Yeah, it, it, it's it's what it is on the box. It's yeah. three, three wounds instead of one. It still yep. could be one. It still could be three, as you said. It could stop you from using a heroic recovery, or it could mm -hmm. keep you at max. I like it. It's great. Yeah, it's uh, fine. Uh, can, yeah, cool. Uh, what else you got? You got one artifact. So it's the Heartwood Hunting Horn. So once per battle at the start of any any battle round, uh, the bearer can say that it will blow the Heartwood Hunting Horn. If you do so, you receive one extra Hunting Harmony Cord for the battle round. I mean, you you are already we're already here sitting here thinking like, what is a good sequence for you know th kill this quarry, kill that quarry, now play like this. You know, you're ta we're talking about how it's like if you kill a quarry turn one, um, now you have two harmony going into turn two. I'm gonna pop the horn this turn. Now I'm at that magical three spot. Get plus one to hit, plus one to wound into turn two. So then I can go do things in turn two and set up for the rest of the game. Or it could be this is the turn I really want to hit that six. Pop it, get the six. So there's a lot of really fun things in terms of like how you're trying to scale up your heartwood, your heartwood, your harmony chords and just kind of play it up there um I, I think a good comparison is uh like demon spark and zinch and guild of summoners where you know generally zinch is gonna pop that when they need the three which is gonna be turn one give me my 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 lord of change but it's kind of similar to that in a way where it's like thinking about what turn you really want that one extra heart that one extra faction point there yeah, and because the Army of Renown can't take, you know, Seeds of Rebirth or Vesperal mm -hmm. Gem or Acorn of Ages, it's not like, is this better than that? Because you can't choose them in this particular build. Yeah. So it's either this yep. or Arcane Tome or yep. something something else from the Universal Spell. I think, it, I think it's an interesting one because it guarantees mm -hmm. you that when you hit five, but you really wish you were on six to maximize the pile in, mm -hmm. or if you were on two and you really wanted the three, I think that's probably where I would probably use it more. Yeah. Is if I'm on two and I want to lead a strike to three, yeah. then I've got the guarantee regardless of what happens on the table and, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I also think uh, thinking about it now, a good compare, a better comparison is um, I can't remember the name of it. The where you get to flip the tides in Ideneth, mm -hmm. where your opponent, you know, I can use it for a late game burst or an early game, like turn one, I want to be two harmony to have plus one to hit and plus one to wound. Turn two, I want three harmony so I can have that extra attack just to kind of throw things off that once per game of just that ramping up my opponent is expecting got accelerated just a little bit for a turn perfect example would be iron jaws right like piggies are coming at your face and you don't have the time to slowly mm -hmm. chip away and mm -hmm. they don't have those really cheap screens so you want to yep. be able to turn to 11 get the plus one attack the plus one to hit plus one to wound asap yeah and this is a great artifact but for other games like you know i don't need that yeah. kind of pace uh, so, all right, cool. I like it. I think it uh, it does what it says, and uh, yep. I would I would run this. I would run this artifact because uh, I I value being able to turn that switch once per battle. Mm -hmm. A grand strategy. Uh, when this battle when the battle ends, you complete the grand strategy if you have destroyed four or more quarries. This feels like the do four or more battle tactics from your book of grand strats. Um, it, we, we talk, it's, it's interesting. Cause it's like, when you use this grand strat, you're potentially putting too much in your opponent's control. Cause it's like, you pick this to be your quarry. Sweet. Like maybe it's a key piece and you, 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 you know, that dumb, usually it's going to be a dumb screen. You're going to have to kill in one of the first two turns. So they're just going to say, I will simply operate without it to deny you three points at the end of the game. Um, it could be pretty fun, but. I like it. I like it because, like, unlike, for example, Spellcasting Savant, where you've got to keep that wizard alive, mm -hmm. all I need to do is kill four quarries. And you've already talked about the value of uh, quarry mm -hmm. selection. 
So if I can kill four quarries, regardless of what's on the mm -hmm. table or not, if I'm tabled completely, I score my grand strategy if I've yep. killed the four quarries. And yep. to me, that's why I like it. Because regardless of what you do, as long as I've killed those four quarries, yeah, I score my... Maybe you see it differently and we don't have to agree. But to well, me, I, I like it for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, like we say, it's Sylvaneth. That might just be a play style thing. It, nothing's wrong. <laughs> Um, uh, but, uh, I, I could see it working because I think a lot of it is going to come to the heroic action, like good usage of the heroic action is your way of preventing your opponent from just pulling that quarry and putting it elsewhere. That does mean you're going to have to put Belthanos or whatever arch revs you have a little bit closer than you might want them to be into the action, which the arch rev wants to put the bubble on the current off. So it helps out there, but it's just like. It's going to come down to a lot of use of that heroic action, which makes Sapwood Leader, the command trait, a little bit more useful because now you don't, you're not using heroic action for heroic recovery. So you, there's a lot of, a lot of different things that kind of go into that. But I could, I think you, you know, I could see the play where the grand hunt works. It's like you say, if you do kill the four quarries, that's three points, done. Yeah, I think for me. Maybe it's my play style or maybe it's just the way I'm thinking about it. It definitely puts a lot of pressure on picking the right, right quarries yeah. at the right time, mm -hmm. uh, not not letting them survive with one one wound. Mm -hmm. And you know, you've got to be really targeted and specific and it'll a, a reward a strategy, strategic player. But you, if you don't commit enough or, you know, you come up against something like yeah. OBR, this is really tough. Like an OBR yeah. army, super tough. Yeah. Zombie spam, super tough um mm -hmm. you know seraphon this could be tough if it's only like you know but then again there's summoning like they yeah it comes down to that it really comes down to the heroic action if you i, I think i think you with heroic action is the linchpin of this grand strat the more i think about it mm -hmm. i think you're onto something there <laughs> Let, let's see how this plays out this could be theory and like it, it seems good but i'm mm -hmm. I, I just like it because it feels like uh zinch fire slayer grand strategy like if you do a thing you score it oh mm -hmm. i've got an invocation up great i have nine d dice great like mm -hmm. uh the three battle tactics by the way is uh you got, let's go through them one at a time kill trophy you complete the, the tactic mm -hmm. if the quarry was destroyed by an attack made with a melee weapon in this turn simple that's what we want to do anyways Depending late game Mid middle 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 to late game unless someone charges you in turn one yeah or it's like you say it's like oh those skinks i was going to kill those skinks anyways you know i i consider this one like there are some battle tactics where it's like i'm just playing my army battle tactics this is like you're just playing your army and it, you're getting your two points yeah agreed uh the second one is encircled you complete the tactic if at the end of this turn all friendly units are in the same large quarter of the battlefield as the quarry mm-hmm yeah, the interesting angle on this is don't kill your quarry on that turn. <laughs> yeah, I, I, this one feels late game where I've got more space. The concern I have is if I had three Kurnoth Hunters with bows, then how I've got to get them yeah, in the water. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That Otherwise, like if I'm not using them or, yeah, I, I think it, that's the thing to consider. Yeah, I think a lot of the, I think this, Army of Renown is going to want at least one or two units of Spite Rider Lancers in every list to kind of fulfill that Tree Revenant role in a way, just in a bulkier body of, for those that don't know, Tree Revenants, if they're musicians alive, get to teleport at the start of the movement phase instead of taking a move. They just get to go anywhere as long as you're nine inches away. And traditionally, they have been just like, here's Surround and Destroy, or here is... Um, what was the Galatian ve uh, uh, veterans one where it was like uh, bring two two people in the enemy territory? Uh, you, you've had, uh, there's been so many variants. There's been um, the the one that you claim the terrain. Oh, That's yeah. a correct. Yeah, you just it's, get just battle tactic grabbers, and you know one to two MSU spike rider lancers are probably going to fulfill that role in this army of renown. Um, and so you know that that one's gonna come into play a lot because you're going to want surround and destroy you're going to want potentially intimidate um and that also comes into play on spring the trap here tree a tree revenant can you take tree revs no no you, you cannot 
No, you can't because they're not. They're not. They've got the right keywords. Yeah, that's why I was thinking Spite Riders could potentially fulfill that role because a fourteen-inch move, pretty good. Uh, the last one being Spring the Trap. So you complete this tactic if four or more units made a charge move in this turn and one or more of those attacks uh, with a with a melee weapon targeted the quarry in this turn. Not the, the hardest, but also not the best. It, you know, use it when you know you're going to, those units are going to live. <laughs> the question is, do I have, do I want to commit four units to mm -hmm. charge in this turn i think that's the key is like do i want to i guess the plus one plus one to charge and plus one to run will help and balthanos can run and charge that helps or even the retreat and charge mm -hmm. that helps um but can i get four of them to charge in a turn that's a big it, question it's a big ask and you know with legion of night running around with counter charge and um potentially mortis praetorians from obr with their counter charge CDs have counter charge now. Coming. Yeah. Well, that's at the end of the charge phase, at least, right? Yeah, counter charge is the end of the charge phase. They fl they get to do it. I can't remember on that. This is not the cities chat. This is the yeah, yeah, I know. yeah. Cities, uh, unless we're talking living cities, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, I so I think this battle tactic kind of hits on something we'll get into later, where it's like, I think you know, it's like Kurnos, Kurnos, Kurnos. I think this army of renown actually wants bugs. Yeah. Bugs, real rev seekers love plus, they love plus one to hit to wound. They love the extra attacks. And getting four charges, if what you're charging is a 14 inch or a 12 inch move base with fly, a lot easier than trying to lug your foot slogging Kurnos up the board. With that strike and fade. Yeah. So it's like when you commit fade. those four things, you know it's got to be able to survive this combat and potentially a combat in the next turn. Mm. All right, so we are on the two-hour mark. I can't believe we've talked Sylvaneth and uh, we've talked Army of Renowned for two hours. So let's do some rapid fire, go through the rest of the rules, right? So everybody now understands the new rules, how it works, how it affects uh, the Sylvaneth build, what you're trading away in order to get it and the benefits of t making those trades if we do do this the question now i have for fred and as we go through this rapid fire um review of sylvaneth is is it worth it and in the current season of primal magic dice given we have no wizards that's a, another mm -hmm. good call out is it worth it is it worth it and if i wasn't going to do it how would i build it so Let's crack on and go right. So Sylvaneth, we know we've talked some mm -hmm. benefits. There's already the groves. We'll get to the mm -hmm. groves when we bring it up on the page. The places of power, we already have a very similar rule already talked about. The terrain features overgrown, healing. So you don't lose out, really. It's the hidden paths and the strike and fade. Do you value these rules enough to not take the army of renowned? Or are these rules just too good for you? Or how does it change you? And and talk to me about these rules. So that's something I've been thinking about. And I, I personally, I think Belthano slotted into an army built to benefit from what he gives of a traditional Sylvaneth army is most likely going to be better. There is a lot of potentially situational stuff with the army of renown to get the full benefits of that army of renown. And a lot of it could potentially be mitigated by your opponent pulling the quarry away and then potentially winning the game on the first two turns before you can even start getting your quarry kills or your buffs. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of armies that are just going to get two five point turns and you're gonna have a hard time lifting anything. Um, that being said, as we talked about, when you if you are able to create a list and find a way to rack up that harmony chords, when you hit three and then when you hit six, there's a lot of crazy stuff you can do. Um, it does feel like the army for now wants the bugs because it's going to give you that mobility to go where you need to be. My opponent put that it allows you to play more reactive to where the quarry goes. My opponent put the quarry in this quarter over here. I can put my things in that qu quarter and still be do things with them because they're so fast. Um, so it, we are an army that pays a lot of points for our mobility. 
We pay a lot of points for our teleport. Three Kurnos with size are 250 points compared to something I think relatively comparable. I think the Rock Guts are 170 for three. And all of that really comes down to like, yeah, some of the base stuff's better, but like we can teleport our Kurnos. Mm. But without the teleport, we're pay- like, I don't think the point values on some of these units reflect the benefits we get from the army of renown they reflect and sometimes i think they reflect too much but that's another conversation our current powers which are the teleports and some of the seasons so it gets really interesting in list building because you want to find that efficient combination from these expensive units so what i'm hearing is that these two rules and like even you can't even get around it because you know your um your tree lords can still walk the spirit paths and things yeah. like that so you can't take that in the army of renown so there's mm-hmm. no even little back door into it all the movement we've talked about how mm-hmm. the value of movement i guess the question is is uh and there's not this is more of a rhetorical question than actually i need mm-hmm. Fred you mm-hmm. to respond is do you how much do you value um strike and fade and mm-hmm. walk the hidden paths do you value mobility on the table and being able to move or uh do you value things like the you know like the spite swarm hive and some of the shenanigans to get faster movement through the the Mm -hmm. um the overgrown or do you just value a fast moving army in general like a piggy army like that's yeah that's a fast moving no teleports but by by gosh they Mm -hmm. they move around the board pretty pretty quickly yep and i mean there is play in a full Kurnoth army of renown. You get these stacking buffs over time, and that's a lot of wounds on a three-up save for your entire army. That gets more and more crazy the more buffs you get. But are you going to be able to achieve battle tactics in the current GHB without that mobility? Also comes into play. Yeah, I think the other question as well is uh, oh, I've forgotten it. I had a question in my head. But, uh, <laughs> it'll, it'll come back. We'll be talking. We're, we're two later. hours in. It's fine. <laughs> we'll talk later. Uh, you got your, your verdant blessing is obviously a spell um great spell doesn't matter mm-hmm. every every wizard could cast it yeah. well yeah i you, casting tree is fun <laughs> well that's the other thing is you're not going to be casting trees you're not going to be yeah. taking down trees so maybe for the people who travel for tournaments this is like oh kumbaya i don't have to right. bring, i don't have to bring true. My <laughs> true this changes the travel meta entirely for nova um, all my, 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 my army, my models were in like my case and everything, but for the trees, I just had a cardboard box, shoved all nine of my trees in, pushed it underneath the seat in front of me and just said, I'll see you when we get to DC. <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to bring trees. You don't, you literally just bring your, your couple of terrain markers for overgrown. Yeah. Yep. Done. Bring, bring your three awakened wild ones to give yourself some cover in your deployment zone and you're fine. What about your seasons? Do you have, uh, without going through it all, like, do you have, um, how would you rank them? Because obviously, you know, the great thing is you can adjust it per uh, army, so you don't have to list those. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 uh, no, no, you have to choose them. Sorry, you have to choose them yeah. um, on your army roster. Yeah. Uh, I was, for some reason, I was thinking it was like, when you rock up to the yeah. table, you can change it. No, you can't It'd be that. sick if you uh, could do that. <laughs> I don't know uh, why I thought that for some weird reason. How would you rank them? From, from one to four, what's the best? What's the best uh, at the moment in the current meta? Yeah, the caveat to all of this is comes 100% down to the list you're running and your play style, like everything else with this army. I cannot emphasize that enough. Personally, I think in the current book, we're looking at the dwindling. Uh, just a free reroll every turn of a casting, an unbind, or a dispel. Saves you from a miscast. Could potentially, like, I don't want to use primals, but that's a five. I didn't, let's see if I get the six on the second go around. Um, very super, super strong. Um, personal favorite is Everdusk. I'm a huge Everdusk fan. I know it limits our teleport range, but exploding sixes go hard with this army. Um, Rev Seekers with exploding sixes just lift a lot of things. Um, so I'm a bit, in Tree Lords, it, it's kind of how, like, the exploding sixes on Sharks effectively makes it they don't need a lot of attack. Tree Lords can't give themselves um, commands. They're not elite. So baby Tree Lords can just teleport near because they're already operating in that six inch range of Overgrown anyways. So now they have exploding sixes. So it makes them a little bit more potent in combat. Um, so I'm a big fan of Everdust. Not so much this season because if we talk about those battle plans, just everything split down the middle makes Overgrown placement super tricky. 
Dolphin Osin Oaken Brow. That could be fun. Um, but uh, you'll, you'll also see, you know, Burgeoning, I think, is the weakest out of all of them. A six up ward feels nice, but you're always more sad when it doesn't happen. And it's a lot less reliable than if it was like a five up ward, like the Lady of Vine spell. And um, the Reaping is pretty good. Being able to just really extend that range of where you could touch things and come in from is super strong. Um, but I don't think it matches quite up to the dwindling or the benefits of the Everdusk if you can get it on. Another thing about Everdusk is remember, Kurnoff Hunters make objectives they're contesting overgrown if your unit is wholly within six of that objective. So with Everdusk, good synergy with Kurnoffs in, in Everdusk. I think dwindling is number one. Yeah, My personal absolutely. preference would be reaping Everdusk. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. probably have reaping just a little higher just because we talked about the sheer value of the, the, yep. um, the terrain yep. rules. You're right. Blood, the bludgeoning is, is clearly the worst. I don't, yep. I, I would not trade. No, this is bad rules. It's just the others are just so much better. Yeah, it pretty it's much. So much better. There are some lists I've seen where burgeoning works, like dryad stuff, but just makes dryads more annoying with their minus one to hit, minus one to wound. But you know what? I'd yeah. rather just I'd rather use Balthanos to turn terrain yeah. into mystical and uh, yeah. reward. Yeah, exactly. I will say um the reason I started playing with Everdust was six up ward, I only ever get sad whenever it doesn't happen. Everdusk is always a pleasant surprise. An exploding six just like, hey, I get one. <laughs> it's very true. It's very it's an interesting half full, half empty kind yeah. of <laughs> Talked about sub factions. Are there ones that are stronger than others right now? So <laughs> given that let's say, for example, Null Root is about wizards and we are in a mm -hmm. wizard season, is this the time to be uh doubling down on the wizard meta or are we talking about some of the other things like uh, some of the interesting shenanigans around Hartwood? Like, how are you thinking about the different uh, sub factions? Yeah, as with everything, comes down to the list you're building. Like, I, because all of these have play to varying degrees, except the Iron Bark. I, I just, I look at that and it makes me so sad. I'm going to use a command point to do D3 mortals on a two up to a unit that charged me on the enemy's turn. They did Iron Bark so dirty. Yeah, it would have been interesting because the old Iron Bark, which are you know tapped into KO and Fire Slayers, there was a lot. Of, there was some cool shenanigans back in the day with with the the Dewarden keyword, but mm -hmm. now they've like really stripped that back. Yeah, yeah, but everything else has a lot of play. Gnarl Root because of the Wizard stuff. That three d six pick two is really good. It is only for one cast, so it makes it easier to get the thing you really want, but. You're still relying a bit on your spell casting and your die ro dice rolls, and you're having to commit more points to battle line than necessarily you'd want. Because this is Sylvaneth. Battle line at its cheapest to get our three battle line requirement is 300 points, which isn't the end of the world, but that's three sets of 10 dryads. Now you're probably locked out of being a one drop, um, which we like controlling turn order. <clears throat> um, and you're locked out of. Um, making like well not so much locked out of much else but it's like that that point stuff and the dryad it, it gets a little weird with like where your points are going do you want more dryads tree revs all that sort of thing where the other ones the battle line unlocks are really key for the other factions uh dreadwood and winterleaf um both have a lot of play i know uh some i can't remember who it was had a really good showing with winterleaf recently no retreat can be really cool with a lot of anvil with a lot of kind of tar pit stuff um especially paired with Everdust, saying no teleporting away. But the usual three you're going to see are Heartwood, Oakenbrow, and now um, uh, a Harvest Spoon. Oakenbrow, super mobile. You have your Tree Lords that are basically never going to bracket until their last wound. Um, good control army, lots of battle tactic denial available there. Same with Winterleaf. Heartwood gives you that plus one to hit on three units. They all have to be on the board, so Beast of Chaos feels real bad. But... <laughs> That's command point value and really good with the Kurnoff bows because they're normally hitting on fours. Now the units you're going to shoot them with are going to be hit. They're going to be hitting on threes and archer up nearby to make them twos. Super good there. And Heartwood doesn't just benefit Kurnoffs. You can make a Heartwood list without many Kurnoffs and still have it be really strong. Harvest Boon, that pregame move is really strong. It gives you a flex option. Um, and you'll see this, I'll talk about it a little bit when I put my list, but just like how you deploy fundamentally changes with Harvest Boon because a 12 inch pregame move is super strong and can force your opponent 
to deploy radically differently than they want to. And of course, bugs are highly mobile. And again, them being unlocked as your battle line allows you to free up points for the pieces you really want that can do other things. Because if you're going to, like, say, spam a bunch of dryads, they're a solid battle line, minus one to hit, minus one to wound, really good. But it's a five up save, and they're going to sit on a point and they're going to do a lot of work. But you're also balancing three dry, three, 30 dryads or three kernos or some bugs. There's, there's always that give and take there. What about null root? Like, we, you just, I don't know. Oh, I'm I thought it's that one. It's, it's really good, and lists built around it are really good. Usually, they're looking to optimize the Warsong Bomb from either the Branch Witch or the Warsong Revenant, where you're going to cast from that tree as high of a number as you can make it happen. Pair it with the Dwindling to try and maybe reroll all three of them if you need to. Or you obviously bring in Primal Magic Dice as, as poor old Fred sneezes. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> how, how dare you sneeze on my on my channel? No, but you get the Primal Magic Dice. I think like, like Slaves the Dark. I just, I just had a chat with the Slaves the Darkness player, and mm -hmm. they have a very similar rule through the Cabalist, yep. and mm -hmm. that has really taken up where previously it was like Host of the Ever Chosen or Knights of the Empty Throne, but now mm -hmm. being the season of Cabalist getting a consistent um whole frost or getting yeah. a better chance of blizzard or even the you know there's a lot of corn right now getting away from um a miscast with corn with yeah. the skull altar or mm -hmm. um the hex gorgeous skulls that can save you in itself yeah. let yeah. alone you know for an unbind or a um yeah uh, spell casting yeah and it, it also it's really good to unbind the thing you really want to unbind it's not a modification so you can't have primal unless you use the dwindling reroll I think it, again, you have three to four, four really good ones, two situationally really good ones, and one, we don't talk about Ironbark. And a, a lot of it really comes down to what do you want to do with your army? What do you, it, it, we keep kind of hitting it back home, but like that's the joy of Sylvaneth. The thing I really love about it is like you can tailor it to fit how you want to play and what your models do and want to do. It's it, it's really cool. Like I've seen lists with like I think a Dreadwood list went four one or five zero like a few months ago. Um, I don't. I think it was it was either Canada or Northeast United States. And like awesome. Like that just shows you how much this book rules. <laughs> and, we, and we talked about it earlier. It's less about the list. It's more about the play style and the skill expression, mm -hmm. which is why I think Fred. Um, as frustrating as it might be for some people, it's like, tell me what the best unit is. Tell me what the best yeah. unit is. It's about how you play, what you like yep. to build. And that's actually yep. a really good thing is because, like, as a kids player, I can build spiders, I can build trolls, yeah. I can build squids, I can build grots, I can build a combination and all have viability and mm -hmm. most of them do really well. That yep. will keep a book fresh and interesting mm -hmm. and that's only a good thing. Yep. What's your favorite command traits and why? Let's not go through them all. Yeah. Uh, favorite war singer. Adding that plus it's when the uh, when your when your model starts its move, so I can move my war singer usually an arch rev fifteen inches because he benefit they, she benefits from it. Make these bugs or these kernoths move three extra inches. Oh look, they have spikes from hive now. They're moving an extra three inches. Super fun. Usually you're gonna see spell singer. Super powerful to be able to cast a spell totally out of unbind range, but or get the benefits from it without even being anywhere near. You're going to see the War Song Bomb, which is the combo where you put a tree out somewhere or cast a tree from a tree to kind of keep spreading your garden. And super good. Radiant Spirit, also sleeper strong. Four up spell ignore should not be slept on in this meta of blizzards and lizards. I was always impressed with War Singer as well. Um, if you didn't want to make your general or wizard, just the ability to get plus mm -hmm. three to move for all Sylvaneth units within 12. Yep. Um, I, I really dig that. Yeah, so good. And shout out to Gnarled Warrior when you slap that on a Durthu. Um, super fun. Not going to happen too much right now as we get to the Grand Strat talk. You'll find out why. But when you do get to make your Durthu your general, put Gnarled Warrior on him. It's like, oh, he didn't make his charge? That's a three up ethereal Durthu that isn't bracking. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although uh, ethereal, eth ethereal, I use you know air quotes uh, with Blizzard running around is a little less valuable. Feels, yeah, just just a little feels bad. <laughs> 
any reason why you wouldn't take the Antorian locus options like Shaman of the Chilled Land or Eater of Magic? Any any initial thoughts? Is the fact that it's a Sylvaneth is just better, or they're just things that you don't need in your army? I think the a better way, best way. I think you kind of hit it on the head. The Sylvaneth one synergizes with us and kind of how we operate a lot better. Um, Shaman of the Chilled Lands on a branch, which are a War Song Revenant, could be pretty good. Um, though Blizzard, thank goodness, cannot be cast through trees. <laughs> but uh, being able to like Horfrost or a Rupture, cheeky Rupture, but then you're now moving your Grand Strat up the board because you don't get the cast through the trees. The big reason why we're super good at uh, uh, Spellcasting Savant is we just get to say, my wizard is going to be able to affect the board, but I'm over here. I think with that that breath, um, Eye of the Blizzard actually might work in your favor. If you were tempted uh, at the start of the hero mm -hmm. phase, if the general's on the battlefield, because you're right, like Shaman of the Shield Land, you've got to be up front. But Eye of the Blizzard, if you're hiding in your Awakened Wildwoods, Longs it on the board on a five up. It's an extra primary yeah. magic dice. Now, mind you, across the the course of the battle, it might get you one or two at best. Mm -hmm. Still is something, or, but is one or two primal magic yeah. dice at best worth something consistent like spell singer or yeah. singer? Like, no, I I, I yeah. don't think I'd yeah. rather just go in Torian acolytes battalion. Yeah, and it's also like you need to keep in mind that. We're almost always taking spellcasting savant, so that means your grand strat is walking up the board, so it can actually do something with the spells. And yeah. you know, it, it gets that's almost like you need to take a war song revenant because you need the four board because it's yeah. moving up to provide the buffs because it can't just cast it from a tree. We're talking a lot of magic here, Fred. Is it fair to say that uh, you would probably not? find yourself in a situation very often although <laughs> although although we talked army of renown the army yeah. of renown has no native wizards unless you go arcane yeah. tome let's put ourselves in the in the world of the army of renown person because yeah. i think every other silver earth list has a wizard i think yeah. you fall into a wizard so let's just pretend that that doesn't yeah. exist yeah army of renown if you were running this uh balthanos Bal army of renown do you get yourself a unique enhancement mm-hmm Actually, would you have a? And let's assume you have enough heroes, right? Because you can't okay. put the because you can't put the enhancement on someone with the artifact. He, well, because because you, you're right, because you can't have an artifact and a enhancement on the same yeah. person. Yeah, Balthados can't take either of them. So let's say yeah. we have Balthados and two heroes. One has so, an artifact. One yeah. has uh, this. In what a situation it? where you're taking, you know, two arch revenants, and you're always going to take Balthados. And I can see two Arch Revenants working really well to babysit your current also your bugs because it's a really good com – they have a command that gives that extra attack, synergizes really well with that uh, with that Army of Renown. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Arcane Tome – and we'll get to why I'd want to take the Arcane Tome later because – Let's assume you don't. Let's assume, let's assume you yeah, don't. Yeah, assume you what, don't. What's, what's, what's the one? What's the one you oh, what? Oh, I see what you're asking. Uh, I personally like the Pouch of Powder, the Null Dust. Um, just a turn of saying, be careful, Seraphon, be careful, Zinch. But I've seen Nullstone Icon do a lot of work by just chaining unbinds. So that it's, I think it's half of one, a dozen, it's half a dozen of one, six of the other. But I think, I think you've raised a good point. And what we were referring to was that if you run Army of Renown, you may put most of your point into your troops and only have one or two heroes. If yep. one of them is Malthanos, and one is just a generic hero, like yep. an Artrev, all of a sudden you may just sacrifice them. And I think we both agree that I would take an artifact over yep. a once per game, really, ability. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, cool. Uh, favorite enhancement and uh, why? I assume it's what I said earlier, like Seed of Rebirth, Acorn of Ages, Vesperal Gem. Are they like your top picks? Uh, Gladius is almost an auto take if you're bringing Durthu. Without Durthu, like, just gotta give that shout out. You always, cause Durthu needs to be within range of an Overgrown to get that fourth attack. So being able to have four plus D3 attacks with him with an already swingy boy. I always joke about Durthu's my favorite fail son cause he will fail you. Never expect anything from Durthu. I love him so much. <laughs> but a uh, Vesperal Gem almost always is what you're gonna take. That is a guaranteed tree song for a rent improvement a or a guaranteed uh, that, uh, virtuous harmony to bring back a model, um, or if you want to be real silly, put it on a tree lord ancient for throne of vines and have him heal a wound every phase. It's just 
really strong and it's a battle tactic. And you don't have to use magical dominance turn one because it's when you're going to be able to get it. Um, you can save it for later and just, okay, I don't have a good battle tactic this turn. I don't need my other spells. I built my list to be fine without spells. Verge with, like, use the gem. Done. Battle tactic is covered. I can focus on other things now instead of potentially risking board position for an intimidate or a surround and destroy or something. I have a wild claim I'm going to make here. So you tell me how wild I am. I'm here for it. If I had a second artifact, let's say I went like Warlord or Command Entourage, mm -hmm. the lamp, the lamp, that making a unit be able to unbind or banish an invocation and getting plus two to the dispel roll of their banishment roll, I don't hate it with corn and fire yep. slayers rising up. And if mm -hmm. we see a world where like Daughters of Cain really step up again and they've got the yep. invocations and mm -hmm. you are seeing more, I don't, I, I wouldn't pick the lamp as my first choice, mm -hmm. but I don't mind it as a second choice because when you go up against priests, um, you can't do anything. Like it's purely uninteractive. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you have a really good point there. And that comes down to your local meta or what you know is going to be at like an event. And then the trade off, as you say, is you become a four drop minimum at that point. As so, you don't take into an acolytes as well, which is another, yeah. and that's probably conflicting with it because you don't have like five or six heroes to do mm -hmm. battle reg and Torian acolytes and yeah, uh, men not yeah. So it's it gets it, it comes down to the fact we're a really expensive army, <laughs> yeah. uh, points wise. But I can see like if there's a lot of corn, there's a lot like being able to get rid of hex gorgeous skulls feels real nice. Gosh, I wish I could just do that in a normal set. Way. Yeah, so I, I think you're cooking with something here, and it always comes down to list and play style. If I went to like a one-day RTT, maybe i take that. Two-day tournament, no. The, if, I, if I know the field has a lot of corn, I just wanted to call it out. Like It's an interesting yeah, artifact. Yeah. It's, not my, it's not my first. We have quite a few interesting artifacts like that, where it's like Acorn of Ages could be pretty good. I don't need a Trail of Nature for a free tree near me. Seed of Rebirth. Not that bad. Uh, you know, Crown of Fell, like, there's a lot of really solid ones there. I do like Cedar Rebirth. That's probably uh, mm -hmm. a personal favorite of mine. Three G GBH spells, Rupture. Oh, that's the old Rupture. Imagine, um, the pretend, pretend the new Rupture's on there. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit this again. Far out. What a, what a, no, we, it's okay. It's okay. We're, we're glad. We, we love our new Rupture in this household. New Rupture. Hot garbage, don't need it right now. We're not going to choose it. Fair, fair? Yeah. Blizzard. Talk to me about Blizzard in Sylvaneth. You've got expensive wizards. They need to be in the thick of combat. You can't teleport. So is new Blizzard worth selection in, in your army? It can be. I, I, can't, I feel like a broken record because I've written and used lists where it's like, I just have my dumb little 110-point branch, which... You, they're going to have to deal with it or not. And if they don't, I'm just going to blizzard something. Basically, you play it like a lot of other people where it's like, I'm just going to have this wizard and move it up the board. And it'll be a Mystic Shield bot until I need it to be something different. Um, Horror Frost is where you're going to get the most oomph out of. A Branch Witch with Horror Frost, or um, you get the Command Entourage and get an extra spell. Uh, Horror Frost, real good. Um, helps your Kurnoths, help make swords even better. Uh, Rev Seekers love it because now instead of hitting on fours, I could be hitting on threes base at the worst. Um, so a lot of, a lot of really good use cases for Horror Frost in our army. And um, again, if we're list building for our spells to not go off, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't go off, but you are committing bare minimum 110 points. That could be tree revs. That could be most of it. it, it it's like any army you're, you're, you're figuring out what those points are worth, but we have a lot of things that get enhanced that uh, get stronger because of Horror Frost. It's, it comes down to the preference, though, because that is a casting value eight. It is. I mean, you do have a lot of uh, abilities to boost, and we talked earlier, Balthanos, for example, could turn something into arcane terrain. So you've got some yep. manipulation uh, yep. if you if you wanted to, right? And I probably agree. Four Frost probably synergizes well. You've got a lot of good recipients that could benefit from mm -hmm. the rend or the hit to wound. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Um, we'll power through a little bit longer. We'll take a short break when we get to lists. And uh, are you cool with that? Yeah. All right. Uh, so we've got your spell choices. So you took me three spell choices. Um, are either of uh, uh, basically uh, the, general, the general's handbook ones? Are they as good to take up a slot? Given that you've said mm -hmm. that you prefer to go like one drop battle regiment, yeah. so you don't want to go for the extra enhancement. Are you taking Hoarfrost over these ones, or is it like Virgin Virgilus Harmony or Dwellers Below, or are these better than GBH? It depends on how you're building your list, as always, because like some lists, I have Kurnoths and Bugs. Virgilus Harmony feels like an auto lock or Tree Song to improve the Ren. Feels really good. If I'm going Null Root, relying on my Mortal Wounds, Deadly Harvest, Dwellers Below, both have a lot of play. Um, if I'm going Tree Lords, Regrowth, you almost always want that with Tree Lords. Casting value 5, given the D6 heal. Throne of Vines, bit. it's really good, but you almost need the Vestral Gem because it's a casting value 9 to go off. Um, feels good when you get that off on an Alariel, though she can't take the gem because it's the person who does cast it. Um, our spell lore is really good outside of uh, most of the things you're generally going to want to do. Tree Song, Virgil's Harmony, um, our uh, casting value 7. Um, and the Spice from Hive and Endless Spell. Um, Skull Root and the, the Glade Worm are both pretty solid, but again, it, it just comes down to what you want to do with your list. Horfrost really helps Swords and uh, Rev Seekers, but if you're not bringing those, some of these other ones are definitely the way to go. So Fred, for the list that you run, what's your top three spells between Sylvaneth and GBH? So rank, give me mm. my top three. Yeah, for the list that I personally run, uh, Har Virgilus Harmony and then Tree Song and Hoarfrost are pretty even because they serve the same function in that list. Cool. Yeah, and obviously, yeah, you know, if you're building around certain things and things get more value, less value, but mm -hmm. they're probably the, the picks that you're fighting right now. Yep. Grand Strategies, you have talked a lot about Spellcasting Savant. Uh, is that the number one uh, for Sylvaneth yeah. in the style of lists? Because you can hide your wizards, you have a lot of yeah. brain, brain locuses, or do you see a world where you're picking like Chorus of the Woodlands or Vengeance and Spite? You're almost you're you're picking Spellcasting Savant. That that's the that's the long and short of it. It makes because. A lot of these are really difficult. We're not often tabling our opponents, especially some like the OBR, the Soul Blight. So Overshadow, really difficult to achieve. Slaughter of Sorcery could work, but we also like, we don't want our wizards then at that point. Slaughter of Sorcery could work with the Army of Renown. Um, Roots of Victory is so easy to deny and you have to always be casting your tree spell. Um, it, it just, it, it, you're, you're pretty much always doing spell casting Savant. That said, we're one of the best at it for spellcasting Savant because we just get to be all the way. We could use a War Song Revenant to be a four-up ward. A lot of different plays there, but it's not a good look really for our grand strats. Though the one we do have, really good. Yeah, I, I could see a world where maybe Overshadow comes in mm -hmm. as well, but spellcasting Savant, the fact that you can hide a wizard in your um, your wild woods, you can have a ward with it, you can block line of mm -hmm. sight. Like It's just a lot of... Yeah, a lot of reasons you go spell casting savant. Uh, Baron Icecape, special shout out to that one, could be pretty solid for us. Lots of ways of killing heroes. Yeah, the changes to the lookout, sir, though, make it a little harder. And, yeah, and, pretty much. Yeah, like if I could keep sniping them from range um, without like ignoring the lookout, sir, and just accept the minus one to hit, yes. Now that you can't see them if they're near a battle mm -hmm. line unit, like blah, 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 a little bit harder. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of hiding wizards at the moment. Any favorite battle tactics? And again, we don't have to go through all of them yeah. for 10 years, but are there ones that you use more There's, than others? Yeah. Is, it, is it your traditionals? Like your intimidate, surround, lead, uh, bait and trap, magical, dominance? No, mayhem. So sorry, mayhem. Sorry, sorry, mayhem, not dominance, mayhem. <laughs> and there's so much to talk about with Sylvanath. So, uh, generally, Magical Dom, pretty easy for us to get, hide in a corner. Um, harness the Spirit Pass, just play your army. Um, uh, surround and Destroy, our mobility really enables that, especially if you're bringing a Tree Lord and Tree Revs, because um, those are free teleports to just get that battle tactic. Traditionally, we keep something in the backfield anyways. Um and uh, Intimidate the Invaders are all very, very doable over the course of a game for us. And then the, the fifth one we're usually trying to grab is going to be situational. You can set it up by putting a tree early on 
in an area of the board you know is going to be contested for eradicate trespassers. Um, just be like, that tree's there. I know I'm going to be using that, and I know you're going to be around it because it's at this key point of the mission. So I'm just going to get that when I see the angle. Um, we're not often going to get bait and trap, but lend to the maelstrom is a possibility, as is magical mayhem or unleash Gyron's wrath, whichever one you want to do. They're both the same spell. Um, so as long as you're working on the four, the other four can just kind of happen over time. As long as you're kind of keeping them in mind and planning ahead, the fifth battle tactic, you got to be looking for the angle for it and set it up because it's really situational, but we're one of the books I think that have a fairly easier time getting five tactics in a grand strat in the current GHB. I'll tell you one that you didn't talk about that. I don't mind uh, balance the cycle with Balthanos coming in and being able to add more overgrown terrain features. Uh, if you were to run Balthanos, um, so pick so, enemy, you, you're gone. Uh, you need to summon a unit for balance the cycle. You complete. The oh yes. Oh, really yeah. Oh, it's, it's the Alario and Lady of Vines battle tactic. That almost never happens. I, I read the first line. I'm like, oh, Balthanos adds yeah. extra, extra overgrown. This if it did good. not have that, so good. So good if it did not need it to be summoned that turn. I would love that battle tactic. It, it was literally the last five words. Cause like, yep. you complete the battle tactic if you destroy an attack made by Sylvaneth unit. I'm like, I can do that. Yep. That was added. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Look, if you want to message the FAQ, the FAQ folks, we can get on this. I'm here. Those last here's, five here's, words. Here's really my good. three page essay about why we should get rid of those five words. That would have been perfect. That would have been perfect. <laughs> that would have worked so well. Like, so I'm, good. I'm, I'm, I'm one step ahead. And um, who knows? May, maybe I'm uh, alluding to a change coming in a couple of nights. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for ruining my day. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Do you want to take a small break to get refill your drink and go to the bathroom? I'm, I'm good to go if you are. I know. Uh, well. I, yeah, I'm good. It's up to you, man. All right. Like, you we, we can. All right. I just noticed your, your water was empty. Was it that obvious? I'm good. I'm good. All right. All right. We'll keep going. We'll keep going. All right. We're going on. We'll pretend this is live. Uh, and I'm not even going to edit this out. Like, it's going to look like. Um, <laughs> it looks, looks like I'm a caring soul. And uh, you are a caring soul. Just, you are a caring soul. AOS coach for number one human. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll be on the magazine of time in no time. So we're going to go through one and a third list. And I say a third because uh, we have three variants of uh, an army of renowned list. So what we're seeing here is Fred's um, Sylvaneth G generic GBH23 list. I say generic because it's not using the army of renowned. This is kind of what you're currently running uh, yeah. when you go to a tournament. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is it? It's a harvest boon with a dw the dwindling from the seasons of war. Surprise! Yeah. Then you've got your spellcasting savant and mm -hmm. your inspired triumph. You got a branch witch, which is a general spell singer with tree song and verdant blessing. Branch witch with hoarfrost and verdant blessing. Tree lord ancient with vesperal gem, verdant blessing, and verdurous harmony. That's a uh, lot of V's. <laughs> <laughs> I regret saying Verdant Blessing because everyone has it. Like, everyone like, gets it from the, our, our, our uh, Allegiance abilities. You've got six Seekers um, with, yep, six Seekers. You've got two units of three of the Lancers. You've got a unit of Tree Revs. Uh, you've got six uh, Kurnoth Hunters with Great Swords. And then you've got the Spite, Spite Swarm Hive coming in as a Battle Regiment. So it's all one mm -hmm. drop. Uh, and it's coming at 1980s. So how does this work? And what's one of the things I need to know about with this list? Um, so this list, I think, is best described as a toolbox list. I don't necessarily have an answer to everything. I think that's pretty hard, almost impossible for most armies to do. But I have a lot of tools available to me to use. Um, and, like, the Rev Seekers could be an anvil, and I keep coming back with a five-up rally from the musician, or, you know, and a two up to come back and a spell. I have a, a Tree Lord of Ancients, like a linchpin piece where he's not great in a lot of roles, but he's like, he's a monster. He has a free teleport. He can bring my spell with an artifact, does a lot of things for me and his free tree. So there, there's just a lot of options in this list. Uh, one of the big things about it, and um, 
that I've kind of noticed as I keep playing it, I have multiple ways of getting key things that I need to have happen. Tree Song and Horfrost are both ways to give my swords rend that I want them to have. Um, I have two hammers that could also be anvils in my Rev Seekers or my Kurnoff Hunters. Two uh, Multiple ways of bringing them back between the rallying on my bugs or the Revenant Seekers War Scroll ability to bring back a model with in 12 on a 2-up or my Tree Lord Ancient with the Verdant Blessing Virtuous Harmony. And because he's that 3-up save with 14 moons, he can be a little bit closer for that 18-inch range spell. Um, I have multiple ways of making a teleport charge become a 6 or even a 3-inch charge. Uh, one way of making it a three, but making it a six inch charge. So my spikes from hive goes off, need a two up, goes off, add three to the charge, teleport, do the thing, or move and do the thing. Or the rev seekers, if say one of these units has less than their full strength, I tell both of these things are end of movement phase. So I teleport in on a two up. I bring that model back within an inch of the unit. That is a two inch base. Now all of a sudden, what was a nine inch is now a six inch charge. And you can combine it with Spike Storm Hive to make it effectively a three-inch charge with the dice there. So a lot of different ways of doing things. The Spite Rider Lancers, I love at MSU. I know that they do awesome in six-man packs. Uh, another shout-out to Mackenzie, who is a wizard with six-man packs on Spite Riders. I don't know how he does it. Um, but just go do little jobs. Hey, go clear this dumb set of skinks over there. Hey, go be the person for Surround Destroy with my tree revenants that are going to, you know, multiple things. They can fight first. Um good it's just got two hammers just a lot of little stuff it's a toolbox it's not necessarily amazing at everything it's amazing at a couple things but like a lot of tools to go do things i can flip the board like i said spite riders with their 14 inch move go be here i'm going to teleport something over here i'm going to charge over here strike and fade to teleport over here tree lord ancient teleport tree rev teleport now all of a sudden the opponent has to deal with my army being completely elsewhere on the board and in a late game situation as everything's been chipped away that's really hard to interact with so it's just a lot of a lot of interwoven pieces that work together and then on top of that on a harvest boon kind of chassis there what harvest boon lets me do i just get to i just deploy on the line all my bugs on the line and my opponent looks at that and most armies have to now deploy a bit more reserved than they want to do. Because if I see the angle, I'm a one drop. I can go first and 12 inch pregame move, 12 or 14 inch move. I'm just going to smack something. I could teleport the Kurnos in. If I get everything off, yeet them in and we're just, I can alpha strike. Normally I would say 90% of the time I'm not alpha striking because, but the threat is there so that my opponent has to deploy more reserved. Now they have to move up the board where I'm just like, okay, sweet. I'm now going to use that move to go into a reasonable deployment, or I'm going to go tag this objective, tag that objective, move my red seekers where I want them to be and just sit here and give you the first turn. You're not going to get anything useful. I've tagged objectives to deny one, two more, unless you're spreading out further. So harvest moon just opens a lot with that pregame move and the threat that it provides. Because just being able to say, I could just, I, I've ran into players where they, you know, it doesn't quite sit that that's a six inch pile in with fly. So then first turn, move up, char, move, charge, bounce behind the screen with the pile in, and I'm punching something else. And if I put a tree over there with the tree Lord Ancient, I'm out after killing your hero potentially, or... I stay in, my Rev Seekers survive because they're 30 wounds on a 4-up save, and then they're just going to run away, and then I'm going to rally them on the next turn and use their two, and it's just a lot of recursion. So it's, it's a toolbox. That's just an alpha strike angle. A lot of angles is I'm just playing the edges, punching them when I need to, and just kind of getting my points and getting tactics. So like I said, it's a toolbox. Not excelling at a lot of things, but a lot of options to, uh, to, to reach into and use do things with. Reminds me a lot of an Iron Jaws and even Nurgle fly list where you have a mm. lot of mo mobility. There's, you mm -hmm. know, obviously there's some pre-game shenanigans in Iron Jaws. You can pre-game move with the flies in Nurgle. Mm -hmm. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. But if mm -hmm. you need to, you can. You can be really yeah. aggressive and commit being a one drop, getting a lot of great movement and then subsequent movement in the actual mm -hmm. movement phase. 
or you can hold back and um, you are less reliant on strike and fade and, you know, the wildwood paths because you have a lot of great internal movement. Yeah. And where, where you leverage it is in your Kurnoth Hunters where they don't have the native speed, so they are mm -hmm. always your... Because I think part of the challenge is sometimes with this 4D chess Sylvaneth is if you have too many units that can use too many rules like strike and fade, um, it can be hard to do which unit is going to take advantage of it. Yeah. You've simplified this by going, right, well, the bugs don't need it. So I don't need mm -hmm. to think about that. All I need to think about is a Kurnoth Hunters, making sure they take advantage, mm -hmm. making sure they stay within range to be able to do the ability. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Even if they they fail, uh, if you if you pile in a little too far and you're now out of the range, they're durable enough to take yep. the hits. And kind of bouncing off that, it could. I've been in games where I just need my Kurnoths to sit here and be a problem on this spot. My Rev Seekers can become the yo-yo if I want them to be, or come mid game, my Rev Seekers are taking a beating. Let's get them out of dodge. Pull the Kurnoths in, and now the Kurnoths ready to go my rev seekers rally use their virtuous harmony they use their war scroll they're back up to five after being limited down to one and then i like rev seekers are amazing horror frost targets as we talked about earlier and then i can yo-yo them and then they can also make that spikes from hive even like as we talked about that combo it's just a lot of a lot of options and different ways of doing things yeah, it's not the list, it's going to be the way you pilot it. And uh, yeah. I think this is a great example of that, is that this will not win on itself, but you have great tools to uh, mm -hmm. to, to really challenge your opponents, which is is really what you want as a Sylvaneth player. And one mm -hmm. drop really helps you dictate the terms of battle. Mm -hmm. The other set of lists, which is my <laughs> three three lists, is um, poor old Fred. You know, again, we are we are recording literally when we're allowed to talk about it, so it's just hitting the shelf as we speak. Um, and obviously, being someone uh, like this, you clearly cannot be playing this out at your local <laughs> tournaments. Yet. Uh, but what we can do is we've got a couple of ideas, and they're still cooking in the oven. Maybe some of them need to go back in for a little longer. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Use, use the knife to see if it's due, it, it's, it's cooked. <laughs> but I think what's really exciting is also the fact that there is no one particular build. And Fred's yeah. been able to build three different builds, tapping into some interesting concepts, but with flexibility. So whether you like your spike mm -hmm. riders, you want to do bows, you want to do lances, you want to tap into seekers, maybe you don't want to go out and buy, you know, six boxes of the of your bugs just yet. You've got a couple of different <laughs> options and one's more of a melee threat, one's more of a movement threat, one's mm -hmm. got a bit more shooting. But give me an idea of what you're trying to do with the three lists, you know, and maybe quite yeah. some of the differences or like yeah. how are you taking advantage of the Army of Renown rules? Yeah, um, I'll start with, uh, we'll just go in order here. The first one, um, I, I remember talking about, like, I love the idea of like, I'm going to shoot them and then Belthanos is going to go in, like if it's a big target, could potentially use that monster's rampage to finish the job but this big threat of just kind of shooting them moving up the board spite riders to go kind of take care of various things belthanos is a melee threat uh very this feels this one's a lot similar to that alariel and bonos that i know math mallow um plays really well it's kind of trying to get that same flavor i have these spite riders to go and do different tasks i have the arcane tome for my grand strat and also give mystic shields out when i need it or in this case a geminids geminids really good with a shooting army because no all-out defense is basically another rend. Um, and, the you know, it does fall off a little bit because you're not getting the Heartwood plus one to hit on a lot of targets, so you're going to have to use your all-out attacks. But something interesting to just kind of think about, just use the Spy Riders, your mobile pieces that are going to go and do things out on the points with Belthanos, and your current off hundreds of bows just moving up to where they need to be and taking their pot shots. Uh, the middle list is the one that I'm personally kind of the most intrigued by, just, like, very similar in uh, thought process to the 11 sharks list we've been seeing floating around. Uh, <laughs> just like trying to see if I can hit critical mass on these bugs. Because I think as we talked earlier, the bugs really like these rules. Mm -hmm. Plus one to hit and wound on those red seekers, um, those extra attacks, that nine inch pile in potentially when you hit six. And if you have seven units or eight units of Belphin, no, all nine units are at minimum 12-inch move with fly in this list. Um, 
with all three Spite Riders and four sets of Rev Seekers. For, uh, the MSU Rev Seekers, they could get lifted pretty easily potentially, but if you don't fully lift them on a two up, that's just more bugs back coming out in my movement phase and just kind of being this really annoying thing where I don't necessarily need to kill things to get my benefit because like I'll have four units in the same quarter as the quarry. I was literally about to call that battle tactic out. This is this is a great example of one yep. that would be able to, to do that. Yeah. Yep. Um, I could also see this taking the Arcane Tome for Spellcasting Savage because it's so good for us. It's just a pretty solid one with the Arch Rev and that D3 heal. But um, the being able to turn, like choose when you're going to get that extra harmony point to go and make some, some crazy stuff happen. The Spite Rider Lancers, because they're strike first in the charge. So you can make this really spicy where... If you have six harmony, bring those fight rider lancers in. Fight first, clear the thing. The other uh, rev seekers that made a charge are gonna now pile in nine inches and do a thing. And it just there's just a lot of really silly things in this list. This is the one I'm probably gonna try experimenting with first personally, just because it the the mobility also fixes some of the battle tactic issues the Kurnoff focused ones will have because they're so slow. Surround and destroy is really difficult. If you're going to commit to surround and destroy, they're never coming back to the battle with a five-inch move. Um, and then the uh, the last one uh, is kind of similar to the first one. Uh, the scythe should be 500 points. I think I did the math right there. That's all right. But if there's any points wrong here, folks, it's because the app is bad. And uh, we obviously, this is a manual list. Let me, you keep talking. Let me quickly check. And yeah, I, I hope I got the math right. Because the idea here is three spite riders to go do battle tactics. Oh, look, that objective's not fully covered or is kind of left alone. 14 inch move with run. Go take care of that. Go do surround history. Kind of be a tree revenant um, equivalent. And then you're just kind of slogging these swords and sides up the board, depending on the matchup or the thing that you want them to deal with the swords go do your thing Scythes, that thing has like needs that red three on it go take care of that and just kind of move up the board with these two big sets of five, uh three up saves while the spite writers go and harass the edges or do different jobs around the board uh let me quickly do the maths because it... yeah let's see <laughs> I, I hope i hope i didn't do this wrong i would be very sad that's all right. it, we'll just we'll, we'll just pretend. Oh, well, if, if the oh, sides yeah. don't fit, just make, bring us back. Nah, nah, let's go. No, nah, I just you, did the I just did the proper math. So the Kurnoth hunters with size are clearly five hundred. Uh, I yep. will edit this post production. Oh. So you don't need to. You don't need to. So no, people like people, but people are, anyway. <laughs> five hundred plus four forty plus one ninety one ninety one ninety three. Yeah, I could and also see this list um, swapping the sides to swords. And bringing a spike from hive with that arcane tome, so you can get the spikes from hive now. Eight inch move with the plus three to charge, pretty strong. Also a rend reduction thing on your turn. Um, also, it could be any other amount of endless spells. I just don't feel comfortable with this army of renown only bringing uh, swords because you have no way of bumping up the rend without access to your our, our spell lore. Hmm. that's why like the, the swords are like the, the first list is going to be much more kind of hitting the edges. Even with the swords, they're kind of working like brute ragers of just like, I need to go trade out these guys, even though it's 220 points, just kind of or maybe the new ogre gorgers just kind of go and do a thing and then be a problem that'll probably die. But with the bows be only one set of bows to take the all out attack, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting situation to be in with the swords because swords really shine because of coherency, but also you can bump up their rend via our spell or a whore frost. It's interesting because when before we started talking, I probably would have said list one of those three would probably be my favorite. Mm -hmm. But now talking through this war for almost three hours, and thank you for, for all <laughs> of your time. Uh, it's been a blast. I, I think like talking through this, and by the way, it, likewise, um, it has been a blast. I don't, I don't want to leave that hanging. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of coming to coming to the reality that I think you, you're you're right in regards to the bugs. I think mm -hmm. when I initially started, I'm a Kurnoth kind of guy. I like so Kurnoth, cool. and I'm thinking about it, but the more I think about not having the teleport, 
I don't know how much I'd want to commit and maybe mm. I have one unit, but if I was yeah. committing one unit to Kurnots, I think I'd prefer them as bows to give me some some abilities to yeah. handle the um to handle the the quarry. Mm -hmm. I can't run and shoot. So I've just got to slow the advance them up the board and just pick yep. the right battle tactics. Mm -hmm. But I do wonder, and I'd love to hear from people when they execute this, what does it look like when you are running these slow blocks of kernels up the board, taking advantage of the, the I guess, I don't, I don't I'm, I'm thinking of this more and more, and I think it is bugs. I think it's the, yeah. the, the, the lances and the, I, I, think, I think it's apps to build. Yeah, I think so too. I think a good comparison for the Kurnoth build would be um, Trug's Army of Renown. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to play it, play it, see it in action too much yet, but you know, the Rocket Army, here's all my dudes with their save and wounds are just going to be tough to kill on a point. Um, it, it feels something similar to that. Um, but but, uh, but but the difference is, is that you're so reliant on the quarry abilities. Yeah. And and trunk, for example, the the rock guts can throw. Your yep. Kurnoth hunters do not throw. Obviously, bows do. But like your swords and you, yeah. That, so to rack up the quarry points, yeah, I. I, yeah, think Lance, I, I think bugs are the right way to go. I think yeah. more and more thinking about this, the more I think the bug list is the the better of the builds. Yeah, and I and I agree uh, personally, but again, it's like we've hit home. You you the your Kurnoff formation could be the right right one, and if it fits your play style, like it's going to work because that's just the nature of the army. We have a lot of great skill expression that almost any list can work. I mean, I've seen lists where it's like someone took thirty spite revenants. And this is before they were 80 points. I think it was back when they were 100 points for five and went 4-1 or 5-0. Like, it, that's just the nature of our army. If there's any takeaway anyone should take from this video, it's like, find the Sylvaneth build that you like and that works for you and play it and master it because this art, anything can work with this army. I have my thoughts and my preferences and my opinions, but it's also like, as we've even seen, you were talking about Lumineth, uh, the lamp, like, there's a really good case for the lamp. Um, so just kind of find what works for you and play it. Um, personally, though, you'll be catching me with like seven sets of bugs at, with Balthanos. <laughs> Can I tell you the biggest disappointment of the armies of Renowned? And it's, it's going to be a weird decision. Like you never would pick what I'm going to say. Skate's Wild Hunt should be able to synergize with this. And I, right? Like, 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 right? Like, like I'm looking at this going, it's the one. There could not be. That's literally my point, is that they're Kurnothy. Their rules are about the hunt. They exactly. are the might of Kurnoth. Yet I look at the keywords and they don't work. Like, I think this is a royal shame that the wild hunt is not a part of this. Yeah, and it's like, you wouldn't want their spell anyways, but, like, them being able to learn a lore spell, if we could get Skate's wild hunt in this army of renown, that would change a lot. <laughs> and they can run and shoot as well and run and charge. Like, this... This, this, what, other than the fact that we're like season two or something, so like it's so out of production, it's not funny. It does feel like it's a royal shame. Oh, like this, be... this unit, this unit, this this feels like it's a, a missed opportunity. Yeah, and it's like you know, it feels like we have to take arcane tomes so we can get a battle tactic as well with magical dom. It's like here's skates. Well, it doesn't matter. It's not a thing. We shouldn't talk about it. But and, boy, you're and, absolutely right. Games Workshop re-release the box. <laughs> will, every, everyone will buy yes. it. It's and such a good you, box. Like that, 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 this feels like a shame. All right, Fred, final question. All right, I've, I've just given you my wish list. Like that feels crazy that that's not even in there. It's be so good. Shame. What do you want to add to Sylvaneth in the next battle tome? Whether it's a model, a style, a gap of something that's missing that you think, like, let, let's end this on a, a, a fun high note. Okay, I have two, I have two wishes. One that's is, the, one is like a personal meme wish. The other is like actual. The, the actual wish is we have a weird spot in our points values around that um, high 100s, like 150 to 200 point range. Um, Spite Riders are in the high 100s, 190, but like we don't have many options to fill out in that 130 to 170 range. Um, nothing really in this army is 150 points. Um, so it does get us into some weird holes there. Um I think that's the biggest thing is I, I uh, is either points to be a little bit 
to, to maybe or, or either points to be lowered a little bit or more options to fill that range as well as some pluses to cast please <laughs> and ability no more spells but um my meme one i want a bug wizard so bad i i want a wizard on a bug i don't you know i i, I prefer like my current offs and my tree lords and all that like bugs are super fun i love them it's what i play right now uh but like i, I a bug wizard would be super fun I'm just imagining. I don't know. My my brain goes to the maniac on uh, the, uh, on a pig for bone splitters, and just like runs up with his pregame move, and then does something silly at you and runs away. I don't know why. I just I just want a bug wizard. I think it'd be super fun. Look, I play Stormcast Dragons, and uh, I said 12 to 18 months ago I wanted a wizard on a dragon, and I didn't get the wizard, but I got a priest. And okay. I think that that that's a part of the Dawnbringers. So that that was also yeah yeah right. yeah. yeah. It's not to say that they like I could see that. I could see a wizard yeah. or a priest on a bug. I think that's Ooh, interesting. Some of the, yeah. Some of the priests would go hard. <laughs> I'd like to see some more monsters. I I, I keep saying it. Like I think yeah. of this I think of Alario like Gyra, the mother, mother nature. And mm -hmm. I want to see her just turn it up to eleven and be super pissed off at us that we just keep destroying our trees and yeah. you know the cities of Sigma are like cutting things down to build their cities and Nurgle's infested. I want to yeah. see like I want to see Mother Nature just absolutely pissed, and I yeah. want her to bring the wrath of the forest to Heck cut yeah. sick like just cut sick with like wind elements and and mm -hmm. creatures that are just like enough is enough. Um, yeah. We're gonna, yeah, yeah, just oh, that'd be super cool. Yeah, like things from the ground, like rocks, oh, and like yeah, molten, and like you know, like, I don't know. I want to see her just absolutely go super Saiyan and yep. um, and be the big bad. That'd be super cool. And then like in the world, she's like, I'm tired of this living. This, the, these cities go away. <laughs> just give five rings to some cities players, and let's bring on Captain Planet for, uh, for the world <laughs> Captain Planet, Captain Alliance, <laughs> whatever. You got, you got all, all, all of them. All of them have like, uh, I don't know. Anyway, we're going on a weird tangent. Fred, I can't wait to meet you in a couple of weeks' time. Heck yeah. People, people want to hear more from you. Are you on the internet at all? Are you on like, a, can people follow you or chat to you? Are you on Discord yeah. or, or, or Twitter or whatever? Where are you at? I, I have a, if Twitter is still around or, or, or X, whatever it is, is still around. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm there, uh, Fred Schmidt or Sarah Cruz, if you can figure out how to spell it. Um, that's also, I am on Discord in the AOS Coach Discord. Um, always down to chat there and, you know, just share opinions and thoughts on Sylvaneth. It's always such a fun army to discuss because it, there's so many cool things you can do with it and so many ways of approaching it. I will put your social handles in the episode so people can talk. And, you know, like whether it's mine or Facebook, like there's so many great ways. Chat talk to your peers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's plenty of things that we haven't talked about. Um, and by the way, if Games Workshop, you're listening, you don't need this feedback by now, but can we just make Dryads a box of 20? Like, can you just find four, a sprue of four <laughs> things and just like, yeah. can you just, can you just, chuck seems... up, just chuck four extra in? Like, this is just ridiculous. Like, please. Like, just, I mean, please at least with the, the 16 boxes, it's like, if you get two boxes, you get Three here, three champions, so I can make them three. But uh, no, put twenty in a box. Or, or if you refuse to do that, <laughs> make them units of fifteen. Just like make them units of fifteen, so I can reinforce them forty fives. Like that's my compromise. That is I, my compromise. I'll shake on that. I'll, I'll shake on that. We can shake on that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll shake on that. Fifty. If, <laughs> if you're not going to give me a box of twenty. And at least only three are wasted as opposed to chasing this weird 16 number that eventually, like, the days yeah. of, like, running 100 Dryads, we used to summon them from, like, first edition, is over. I mean, bring back the branch rate. I I've never gotten to play with her because I'm still kind of newer, but, like, I, I hear that all the time. So for my Sylvaneth friends, bring back the branch rate. <laughs> Uh, no, you got her in the Lady of Vines. Like they, they repackaged her essentially to be the Lady of Vines to give that rule. So that unique rule is gone. But she was the old Drycha. Like she, if you look at what mm -hmm. she was, she was the original Drycha from Fantasy Battle. So that mm -hmm. model's gone. Tragic. Fred, 
You are an incredible guest. I'm so excited. I'm glad we got to talk about this. Sylvan F. Folk, I hope you enjoyed our discussion. Whether you are going to run the Armies of Renown, whether you are going to just run your traditional <coughs> Sylvan F in GHB 23, whether you pick up uh, Valthanos or you stick to what you've currently got, I think you have enough insights here to um to think about how you make the most of the faction and respond to the meta and obviously you know flesh eater courts will come and cities mm -hmm. will come and things will improve and up you know there's always something going on but i think you I think fred has done an incredible job to 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 highlight the silver death the way that we currently stand yeah thank you so much for having me this has been a blast as uh, many of my friends could tell you i could talk endlessly about sylvaneth as i'm certain you have now learned <laughs> I, i'm happy to i'm happy to talk sylvaneth and shout out to your, your cat familiars who also made a guest appearance yeah uh if you do want to grab uh the the sylvaneth things like the new box or the book again i mentioned episode li link is down below uh support uh Wolf Fire minis or mm -hmm. element games if you are in the uk or in um in uh usa um fred thank you so much hope to see you guys all in the the discord link is down below leave a comment yeah. uh give us a like tell us how great fred is and um <laughs> we'll chat later yeah thank you so much for having me bye everyone no, absolute <laughs> pleasure thank you so much Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spell cast.